Muito bom dia a todos. Vamos então iniciar a sessão de hoje com a doutora Diane Dunning com o tema Aquatic Therapy. Doctor, you may start. So this morning we're going to talk about aquatic therapy, water therapy. But before we start, I thought because maybe some of us are getting a slow start, I'll tell you more about where we're from in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I showed you this before. This is our campus here. And this is our brand new uh, companion animal hospital where we have neurology, oncology, cardiology, dermatology specialties, all the specialties, internal medicine, all throughout here. Our research building, our main administration building, and my office is right around here. And then the large animal facility. The next few slides I'm going to show you is this area, which is our teaching animal unit. And so it's basically a functioning farm. So this is the back side of it, and where we have pastures for our dairy, which is right in here. And we produce um, our own ice cream, which is very popular and award-winning with the students. These are some, for us, historic barns. Now, when I say historic in the United States, particularly like in Raleigh, that's about 130 years old, okay? Not very old, but they're actually quite beautiful. Here are our cows, which I told you yesterday, some of our students have never seen. So that's a cow, very happy cow, beautiful cow, Holsteins. Here's a close-up of our barn. We have two of these. And again, the architecture in them is very typical for this particular region in the United States for our barn. These are our um, production medicine or food animal medicine facilities where we introduce students to production animal farming. Um, so we have a swine unit, we have a poultry unit, we have a, a turkey unit, um, as well as various ruminants, goats, we have llamas, um, sheep, etc. out here. And the students get to work with them all through the first three years, regardless of what they decide they want to do. So in our curriculum, we track or we have focus areas of our students. So somewhere in your second year, we expect the students to decide and declare what it is that they would like to study. And most of them will go and say, I'd like to study small animal, which includes dogs and cats. But the second most popular is exotics and special species. So we have students um, who focus solely on fish. We actually have fish scholars. Um, in there, that, that is their entire area of studies. We have laboratory animal medicine, public health, um, I'm going to forget some, equine, food animal, and then mixed animal species. We also have a, a research track as well. And here's some of our students and staff, baby goats, always cute. This is our library, okay, and the front entrance to our college. This is a whale um, that washed up on the North Carolina beaches about the same year that our college was founded, about 30 years ago. So we're about the same age as you all here. Um, and then the anatomy instructors basically took the whale and, and created a beautiful specimen that's suspended from our ceiling. And our library has just been renovated and it's, and it's again, it's a quite beautiful place to study um, and for students to gather. This is the Terry Center. This is predominantly where Dr. Olby works. And we have specialty areas that combine um, like specialties together. Um, this particular one here is the Hannah Hart Pavilion. And so this is where our cardiologists um, spend the majority of our time. And this is uh, Hannah herself. And this is uh, one of the donors who named that particular area of the hospital had a Newfoundland in which we put in a, a, a prosthetic heart valve in and prolonged her life. Um, so there's a little statue of her there. This is inside of our hospital. We just moved in this new part of the hospital about a year ago, and this is our ICU. Obviously, we have equipment in there now, but it's a quite spacious facility, and this is just our intensive care unit space, which is quite spacious. It's probably about this quarter to half size of this room, just for ICU. And we have the ability to ventilate animals, to 24-hour monitor animals. We have staffing in there, um, and excellent faculty. And one of them in particular, that's my husband. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Oh my gosh. All right. 
That's him, and he were, he's an in internal medicine faculty. He's an excellent lecturer as well, so. Okay, so this is another piece of fancy equipment. Um, this is our biplanar fluoroscopy unit. We're probably the only veterinary college in the United States to have one of these. And this allows our cardiologists to do procedures that we used to have to do thoracotomies. I love to do thoracotomies. They don't call on us very much anymore because they can do it all non-invasively through peripheral vas vascular access, so like from the femoral arteries. So for um, PDAs and things like that, they'll just basically catheterize a vein and fix it that way. Much safer for the animal. We have facilities that look pretty similar to yours as well. Here's one of our standing surgery units with the hoist, stocks, and machinery in there. Pretty similar stuff. But that's not why we're here. We're here this morning to talk about water, okay? We're gonna talk a lot about water in the next few minutes. Okay, some of the things we've touched on, but the factors that make water such a great therapeutic modality is that uh, it's buoyant, or it has the properties of buoyancy. It has the properties of hydrostatic pressure. It has a, a specific gravity of one, which we'll talk about, which we will vary up and down from there, and that's responsible for making us either float or sink in water, depending upon how many cheeseburgers you've eaten in your life. Um, it's viscous, so it provides resistance when we exercise. Um, and then the water temperature you can also manipulate. We generally keep it fairly warm, though. So in terms of buoyancy, okay, buoyancy is a wonderful thing. It reduces the amount of gravitational forces on an animal. So if you have an animal that's lame, they'll become less lame. If you have an animal that's neurologic, they'll actually be able to move better and more easily in water, okay? So those cases are my favorite cases to put in water almost straight away, and particularly Dr. Olby's cases that she does the dorsal approaches on, it's pretty safe to put them in water very, very early on because we're not submerging them, okay? And they do really well, and it gets them up and active quite early on, reduces that dependent edema, um, and, and, you know, kind of also reduces the kind of malaise of having surgery and being hospitalized. Um, it allows for quicker intervention and quicker recovery times. Um, and then animals, again, that have poor balance and are weak um, are able to stand, for the most part, unassisted. And they can move without a fear of falling. So it's a really great thing. So when you have an immersed body at, uh, at rest, the buoyancy causes uh, an upward thrust of forces that is equal to the same amount of water that's displaced. That's Archimedes' principle. I don't know if you remember that from your distant education. So in terms of hydrostatic pressure, that's the actual pressure that the water is placing on the animal when they're in the tank, okay, or in the pool. And that you can actually see very significant cardiovascular shifts within water, particularly if you get up to your neck region, okay? Um, and this dog obviously isn't experiencing much because it's down around, the water's down around their ankles, but it's directly proportional to the depth of immersion. And in fact, actually, they've done some studies in obese patients, people, um, where they've looked at exercising in water versus exercising in land. And they found the animals that exercise in water actually proportionally lose more belly fats or abdominal fat than the animals that actually, or people, people are animals, that um, exercise on land treadmills, okay? So if you have a really heavy patient, water is a good thing. This is a dog in an underwater treadmill that actually had a patellar surgery and was having difficulty actually moving in a full range of motion. So what we're doing here is using a resistance band to actually increase the um, difficulty of actually putting him in full extension um, and then helping him with the flexion of his hip and stifle joint. Okay, hydrostatic pressure. Again, we've just talked about that, but that's really actually the combined forces of gravity, buoyancy, and the lateral forces of water all working on the animal. So as you d increase the immersion of an animal in water, you increase the hydrostatic pressure. So if you have an animal who is swollen, has dependent edema, 
um, potentially even some cardiovascular compromise. That will help in terms of improving your cardiovascular re return. Okay, let's talk about specific gravity. So there's one of my text babies there that was in there watching the, the puppy. So um, the specific gravity, again, as I alluded to before, is one. Okay? The specific gravity of an animal is either going to be usually lower or higher, and it's dependent upon, again, how fat you are or how much fat you're carrying on your body. If you have a high fat body fat content, you're going to float, and that's because your specific gravity is greater than one. If you have a low lean body mass, something that I haven't had for a really long time, okay, you're going to sink. So I have a tendency to float. I bet you all sink um, in water. And this particular case, this was actually a tremendous back fracture. We're going to show um, this little boy later. And he was actually quite compromised, very lean dog. We usually would have to put a life vest on this guy to actually help him um, stay afloat in the water. <coughs> Here's a fat little corgi. He probably doesn't need a life vest, but there are various ways that you can deal with the specific gravity issue and how buoyant an animal is with flotation devices, life vests, water wings, okay? Water weights, if they're too buoyant, you can tether them as we did with this particular dog, suspending them or um, immersing them in water. You can use slings, that's very easy. And also it can be easily removed and placed on the animal. And then finally, you can use people, which is my favorite one, okay? And here's a, uh, a technician in the water with that dog that I showed you before doing the actual gait um, training with the dog, but also just ensuring that this particular dog who had a very difficult time floating, look how high we have the water in there. We're gonna talk about that too. Unfortunately, to make animals swim, some of them, you have to make them feel like they're drowning. You don't drown them, but they have to feel like they're going to drown. So sometimes we have to put the water up pretty high. Fear is sometimes a good thing. OK? OK. Uh, in terms of viscosity, OK, that is resistant of an adjacent fluid layer sliding freely by another. And that creates friction. I think you remember this particular dog. Oh, it's not going to play. Lots of splashing, right? Okay, there's a lot of friction going on there. And it creates, the animal has to have force to move through that actual water. And the more submerged they're in, the more force they have. And that's that phenomenon when you're running on the beach and you start running in water, the difficulty of running exponentially increases as you submerge yourself in, in, the, in the fluid. Okay, here's a kitty cat. Someone asked me about kitty cats yesterday. We're going to show you a little video. Cats do pretty well in the underwater treadmill. You do have to acclimatize them. But resistance is uh, increased or decreased by altering the area of contact and increasing or decreasing the drag, okay? And you do this by altering the depth of immersion. Or you create kind of things on the animals like weights or tethers to increase the drag. Increasing the resistance will increase the cardio, um, cardiovascular workload. Um, over time, if you exercise them in this manner, it improves the muscle mass, increases stability because you have better balance, and also increases the challenge um, of the actual exercise. Okay, here's a dog that has a lot of resistance. This was my dog. He unfortunately died. This is Murphy. But he was one big, fat, happy golden retriever but um, he, he was a part of a cardiovascular study, and we actually had him hooked up to EKGs in here, and we were looking at the actual amount of work we were asking him to do within the water at various heights of the water, okay? And no surprise, the more water we had in there, the more work he had to do. You see him sloshing around in there? That's his big belly moving back and forth. He's a good dog, okay? In terms of water and temperature, um, water is a very efficient conductor of heat, okay? It transfers heat 25 times faster than air, okay? So if you want to warm a patient up, get them wet. The only problem is drying them off and having them not lose heat, okay? Um, it will potentiate the effects of thermotherapy, and it's very, very helpful in the cases of osteoarthritis. So if you have an osteoarthritic patient, putting them in water is wonderful because they can start to move better, more easily, and with less pain. 
So it's actually a form of pain um, uh, therapy. Okay, so benefits of aquatic therapy, improved active range of motion, okay, um, particularly helpful in diseased or, uh, and in normal animals, okay, improved muscle strength, improved endurance, it's very safe as long as you um, monitor them. Never, cardinal rule, number, number one rule is once you put an animal in the tank, you never, ever leave them, okay, ever. And in addition, it's also very, very important that if you have only one person able to work in that area, that they have an ability to call someone, okay, um, whether they're in the tank or not. So our technician has um, a mobile phone, okay, and a walkie-talkie, particularly when she's working by herself, because occasionally she'll have crisis situation where the animal will go down in the tank, or for whatever reason the tank will malfunction, and she has a, an animal in the tank, she either can't get them out or she's having to uh, suspend them in water. And they, they can be quite heavy, even in water. So you need to be very cognizant of that because it would be a death knell to any program to have a patient drowned. And it's quite possible to do, particularly when you're working with compromised patients, compromised neurologic patients, onco oncologic patients, or even orthopedic patients, okay? So number one rule, never, ever, 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 I'm going to say it one more time, ever leave an animal in water, okay, unattended. The final thing is that um, it's a minimal concussive forces. Even though I gave you all those ever, ever warnings, it is a very safe activity if you use it appropriately, okay, um, because the animal really can't fall, okay. They can drown, but they can't fall. I showed you these yesterday, but I think it's worth reminding, maybe, it's not going to play. Huh. Oh, we're not going to show you that. I'll show you another one. Um, indications for aquatic therapy, osteoarthritis, um, because you have improved range of motion and mobility, improved endurance, improved quality of life. We have animals that are very geriatric, and they come in for what I call little tune-ups. And so they come in just for a little exercise session. Sometimes it's just once a week. Okay? They get a little acupuncture, they do a little exercise, and they're good for the rest of the week until next week, and they feel so much better. And that correlates to studies that have done, are done in um, assisted living facilities with extremely elderly people. They find the people that actually have some sort of activity or exercise program, particularly those with water, actually have uh, lower disability indices, so they're more able to move and be active and interactive with their community if they exercise. And again, particularly in water, okay? Um, for post-operative fractures, uh, cranial cruciates, total hips, okay? I'm a big one, even though I'm trained as a surgeon, I don't think that, I think if you've done your job appropriately, okay, you shouldn't have to worry about your repair, okay? If you have a tentative repair, don't blame whatever, the rehab facility or the owner for it failing. You just didn't do your job, okay? And so you should probably go directly back into the OR, all right? Um, if you get them up and active, okay, safely, I'm not talking about dropping them or letting them fall or letting them run around like, you know, fruit loops, okay? Um, you could minimize the postoperative muscle atrophy, get them up and functioning, and providing them a safe environment to exercise. And for owners, it makes them feel better about the recovery process as well, because they get to interact with their pets. It's usually very positive, um, and they see their pets improving, and they actually are usually participating in that improvement, because it's a, a joint effort. Okay, other indications for aquatic therapy? Neurologic impairment, again, the neuro cases uh, are the predominant caseload within our facility, and that's pretty common throughout the United States. 75, 85, even sometimes 90% of our cases are neuro cases. And the reason for this is you can have controlled early assisted ambulation, and many of the cases that are seen by our neurology service you know, are complicated, and it's really hard for the owners to provide care at home. Um, they either are having difficulty with bladder expression or they're having difficulty with actually maintaining them to be able to stand or to walk or get up and outside or even maintaining their hygiene and just general care. 
So having a rehab facility like we have, we're very fortunate, is that kind of step down from being in the hospital. Usually we like to do it as an outpatient therapy, but occasionally for the dogs that are quadriplegic or um, you know, paralyzed in all four, it's a nice place to bring them that we can take care of them and actually work on them during the day and have them rest at night. Other indications for aquatic therapy, I've mentioned this before, but we have a little obesity program. In the United States, we have things like Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig. That's kind of like what we have here. So when they come into our obesity program, they have a nutritional evaluation with our nutritionists. They talk about diet, they talk about the home environment and their interactions with their owners, and they develop a plan there and an educational process to deal with the diet. Simultaneously, what we do is we look at the activity that they have at home, okay? What are they doing? And oftentimes, what you'll find is the dogs are in weekend warriors. So what they do is they go all week, everyone's really, really busy. They don't do anything during the week, and then they do everything on the weekend, and they end up either lame or not wanting to do very much or being exercise intolerant. So the biggest part of the educational process is that we split that exercise session up over the course of the week, and sometimes, as best we can, a couple of times a day. And they're much shorter, okay? They don't have to do everything all at once, but it's consistent, and it's moderation throughout the week, and you have better weight loss that way, okay? They're probably doing less overall, but it's spread out um, overall. So um, the weight loss program combined with the nutrition, again, they've studied in people, Either one will work individually, but together they're symbiotic and very, very powerful, okay? Oftentimes these guys will also have concurrent disease, so it works well with, with those things in addition to the obesity. And they've done studies in animals that if you lose weight, just solely lose weight, okay, you'll have at least a 20% reduction of your clinical signs if you're overweight. So it's a very, very powerful thing. In terms of cardiovascular um, function, you'll have improved venous return, particularly when you're in the tank, a lower heart rate when compared to land exercise. And in people, it actually, they report an, an increased sense of well-being. And that corresponds to that study, study in the assisted living facility that people just have a tendency, if they're in the water, they have a tendency to feel better. Here's the kitty. This is a fairly long video, but we can just talk. Okay, so you know, people were asking, well, can you put cats in water? I'm like, yeah, you could put cats in water. Maybe not all cats, but, but most cats, as long as it's not a threatening environment. And this was a cat that unfortunately was run over by its owner. It had a back fracture at, uh, I think, L5. This has been a number of years ago. People were very excited in this video that we're, we're putting a cat in, so you're gonna see people walking around and talking, okay? And basically, the nice thing about the underwater treadmill, or even if you use a pool, it's nice to put them in the environment when there's no water, okay? And then slowly start filling it in. And if you can do that in a way that it's not a lot of splashing, not a lot of noise, um, they usually adjust quite well, surprisingly, okay? So we're gonna put some water in here, and you're gonna see the kitty start to swim, okay? We are gonna have to scruff her a little bit, not too much. Okay, oh, we're gonna to transition to putting the water in. Okay, there she is in the tank, looking around, saying what's going on. This is Gunner, by the way. Okay, and you're gonna see right now the water's gonna start coming in from below. We're looking around, we're not too stressed out though. Here it comes, you can see a little bit. Okay, let me kind of get them in position and we start working. We're mewing, <laughs> we're saying probably it's not their favorite thing to do, but overall, not too bad, right? And I can tell you that this is the reaction pretty much of most of them. Now, interestingly enough, the ones that I've had that have been really, really hydrophobic, really afraid of the water, have been dogs. And I've had about three or four dogs. And you always ask in your history, you're going to see this, dog, uh, this cat doesn't have much motor response in the rear. Now again, you're going to have to put the cat down. You have to do this in dogs. When you swim them, 
to a point where they actually feel like they, they have to swim, okay? And this is very early in the cover. This cat went on to recover completely. This is the point very early on that we didn't actually have much motor in the rear. But so you have to get the water to a level that they are gonna, they feel like, okay, this is serious, I'm gonna have to swim, okay? You don't get their noses in, you try not to submerge their head, and you try not to get water in their face, and that includes for dogs, okay? They don't like that. Um, but you do need to get them to a certain point. And most animals, it's at the point of the shoulder. Somewhere in that, that cross the line, when you get the, to the acromion process, that's when they start to swim, okay? And there's the kitty afterwards. See, everyone's happy, we're okay. Um, limitations of any kind of aquatic therapy, this is something that you know, you're, you're doing right now very well in your, your hospital, is the initial expense. There are a variety of different underwater treadmills out there. If you do get one, I would tell you to do your research, okay? They are not all the same, okay? And I've personally bought a lemon recently um, that we had to return to the company. Um, so do your homework, call up people that you know that may have these. We have a, an Aquapause, it's made by Ferno, um, works very well, it's one of the more bigger utilitarian tanks. It's a, it's a big tank, it's a noisy tank. Um, most places install it into their already existing facilities. If you're building a new facility and you think you're gonna do this, talk to the underwater treadmill people first because it's really nice to house all this equipment elsewhere and not in the room. It's much quieter, okay? Um, and they can come in and they can do a consult for you, even if you're not gonna buy a tank right away. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to at least think about because all the places I've worked, I haven't done that or I've had to retrofit different rooms and I've always had to have all this equipment here and it, is, it can be loud, okay? The other thing you need to know is the upkeep. It is, it's a lot, okay? And I don't know if anybody has pools or anything around here. It's even more than that. There's a daily protocol and procedure that you have to do with this water tank to prevent infections. There's also protocols and standard operating procedures that you have to follow um, in terms of limiting what patients can go in there, particularly our neuro patients. So if they have a urinary tract infection or if they have uncontrolled bowel movements, we don't let them in the tank. You know, even if we want to put them in the tank, we don't. We have a, a small uh, portable pool area that we'll put them in that we can actually easily drain the water, but we don't put them in here. Because when we actually contaminate this water, we lose it for an entire day, okay? Because it's, it has that many gallons of water in it. Um, so we have protocols that we do daily in terms of cleaning. Weekly, we dump out the tank water unless we've had a massive accident or it's, it becomes dirty. Um, there is an inherent risk of an infection, so we culture the tank um, periodically and we have a standard procedure for that. So incisions have to have a minimum 48 hour seal before I put them under water. That's pretty um, aggressive, I would say. Most people would wait till suture removal, but I like to get them in water because I firmly believe that it's a, it's a powerful tool. Hydrophobia, really not that big of an issue. I'm gonna put a goat in on Wednesday. Um, I haven't really found an animal that I can't put in my tank, okay? Um, mostly it's been dogs, and it's been surprising which dogs just, just won't or won't tolerate it. And it's been about, I would say, four in my career, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, all right? And then finally, I'm not gonna say this again, but uh, never leave an animal unattended. Okay, you can manipulate the water as well uh, with jets, gait patterning, uh, weights, water wings, and swimming. Okay, so here's Buster again. You saw this video before, but here's gait patterning. It works really well in water. You can do this on a land treadmill. It's easier in water, okay? Just because you have the buoyancy of water working with you there. Okay. Aquatic massage. A lot of underwater treadmills have the added extra component, and this is an extra cost, but of jets, okay, therapy jets. Now, if it was you or I in there, we'd immediately order, order that because we like hot tubs and jacuzzis. You know, dogs don't really like it as much, but it's great for dependent edema, okay? Um, and it's great for massaging out um, swollen joints, hurt, hurting joints. Dogs don't really, again, they don't really like it, um, but, it but it's a useful tool, okay? 
Um, you can use it for breaking down um, bridging scar tissue. It's less painful than doing a frictional massage. Again, you get improved local circulation, helping with edema, reducing muscle spasms, nerve sedation. In theory, you'll read everywhere, it's relaxing. I don't think most dogs, again, it's noisy, it's bubbly. Yeah, they don't, they don't think too, it's too great. Swimming. Ugh, oh, bad, that video doesn't work. Anyway, that's a dog who's paralyzed in the rear. Um, benefits, again, no concussive forces, excellent cardiovascular benefits, and active range of motion. None of these are working, that's interesting. Um, okay, more, um, more indications for swimming, obesity, particularly um, for conditioning, post-operative FHO, like that case that I showed you. And again, FHOs, even if you don't have water, get those dogs up and moving. It's criminal. I actually think it's negligence to not, okay? So, so get them up and moving. You'll, you'll cause more problems by not. Um, you can use it to uh, help with improving muscle mass and fractures, intervertebral disc disease to watch for a motor, and then any time that you have range of motion concerns. In terms of tricks of the trade, life vests are a must for most dogs, just because actually, unlike people, you know, not all of our dogs are quite as fat as we are, okay? So they have a buoyancy issue. The other really nice thing is it turns them into a dog suitcase, okay, with a handle there. And it's a really useful tool to keep a hold on in the, in the water. And if you don't use that, use slings. The only thing about slings is it has a tendency to sometimes impinge on range of motion, particularly at the coxofemoral joint. Um, swimming against jets. And then, you know, if you have a Labrador or any kind of ball dog, using toys to encourage, or food. Many dogs are food motiva motivated. And the sessions are pretty short. And most dogs get very tired very quickly. So it's not uncommon for some of the dogs post-operatively for us to start anywhere from three to five minutes and then work our way up. We do that a couple of times a day. Okay, and again, the depth of the water, I know why it isn't working, I didn't put my jump drive on here. The depth of the water will also um, impact how the animal moves its limbs. So whether it's um, very submersed or very low in the water. And actually, even if you have low levels of water, they'll have a tendency to pick their feet up, actually up and out of the water, and you can get a great range of motion in, in that with, with very little uh, work. This is very easy, direct hydrotherapy. Very low tech, hose um, and water. Um, and it has a great yield in terms of relieving edema and pain, just simply by using a hose on a limb. Keeps them clean, um, and it's great for post-operative infections. This is something we don't use very often, but um, using ice in a bucket and immersion, okay? Um, the, the benefits of this is obviously it's non-invasive, it's um, very low tech, no special equipment is required, and you can treat particularly for peripheral limb edema, so um, tarsal and um, metatarsal and metacarpal fractures, um, it's great for edema and inflammation. External fixators, it's wonderful um, and better than cold compresses, but you have to be very careful that you're not um, chilling the implants down to the point that they become painful. So if you do use ice in a bucket, um, you need to uh, make sure that you don't do that more than a couple of minutes, okay, because it can be quite painful, all right, and patients will object. Here's an external fixator. This is wonderful for really, um, you know, it's wonderful for um, open fractures where you have lovely granulation tissue in there and keeping the granulation clean. So you can use it for severe uh, trauma and lavage and debridement. It doesn't have to be saline. Regular water works really well. Again, immediate post-operative edema reduction. Um, it's very safe uh, and it's good for difficult animals. Okay, so water fundamentally is great, okay? Um, and you can use all the properties of water that we talked about to achieve therapy goals. Buoyancy, you and manipulate that. Um, if you want an animal to have less weight bearing, you increase the amount of water. If you want them to have more weight bearing, you decrease the amount of water. Viscosity, same thing. If you want to have a more viscous, more friction, increase the water. If you want to have less, or your animal's having difficulty, decrease it or eliminate it. Put them on a land treadmill. If you want to have increased resistance, 
Um, basically, you do the same thing with the viscosity. Balance, again, um, is, is a great way to use water because, again, they're buoyant, they won't fall, okay? And then we talked all already about reducing edema. Oh, I'm going to show these to you later. This is a dog um, on a land treadmill and underwater treadmill. We'll get to that later. Okay. The final thing, oh, this is killing me. The final thing, I'm going to show you this one too. Animals cheat, okay? You wouldn't think that they would, but they do, okay? And so um, in the next lecture, I'll, I'll put a couple of all these slides in that we missed the videos on. But basically what they'll do is when you're not watching or if you're not watching carefully, these treadmills have um, uh, bars on either side where the therapist can stand and not move on the treadmill and, and manipulate the animals. Well, what they'll do is they'll figure out pretty fast that if they glide over to one side, okay, um, and they can basically stand and then just pretend to move one half of their body, okay? And so if you're not watching really closely, they, they will do that. And particularly this little basset hound was a scoofus in that. So he would meander over and he just then meander the other side. So at any rate, um, I'll show you. It's a very funny video. They, they do cheat. So you can't let them cheat. All right. Hopefully this video will work. This is for Dr. Olby, who's been showing me videos of her baby all weekend long. And so... This is what she has to look forward to with her children, okay, when they get a little older. Mine are obviously much older, so they, we used to have these dance parties, okay? And my son is like a straight arrow, so you know, you tell him to do the robot or the octopus, he does it. My daughter, I think, is going to be a stripper, unfortunately, <laughs> but she, um, she's quite the exhibitionist. To get her to wear clothes is sometimes difficult. She's 10 now, so she's a little bit better. But <laughs> And I think Dr. Olby's daughter is going to be very similar to my daughter and kind of crazy. Yeah, see, my son's doing all the moves perfectly. You know how many years it took me to train them to do this? It's great. It's good for parties. I encourage you when you all have kids to do this as well because you can just trot them out. You're, you know, the party gets boring. Trot out your kids and they dance. So it's great. Okay, but you do have to work on the training. So I find at least twice a day having dance sessions greatly improves their capabilities and their number of dance moves. So you, then you can call out dance moves and they'll immediately do it. Okay? That was for you. Okay. Any questions? And I'm sorry about the videos. I'll put them in the next, next time um, for you to see. No há perguntas? No há dúvidas? Nada? Yes. Do they take long? Do the treatments take long? Yes. I didn't tell you about that. The biggest thing, so I talked about all the expense of the machines. Um, the real expense that you have here, getting feedback, is your, your time, okay? And so it's, that's a really insightful question. Um, so, and that's one that I didn't anticipate when I first started doing this. But it's all about time. And so what you have to weigh is, is it valuable of your time or potentially good for you to train your technical staff to do the procedures. So in the United States, what we do is we have practice act laws that as long as I assess and, and diagnose and then lay out a prescriptive plan of therapy, I can tell my technician what to do. And she's very good. Uh, we were just talking about this prior to this, very good at carrying out the various procedures under, under my observation. And so then I can go and do something else as well. But it does require you being able to designate that person, and it does take a lot of time. Um, so on average, um, one person, if you have one person doing this particular um, uh, caseload that we have, and we have a lot of down dogs. We have a lot of dogs that are quadriplegic or at least have some form of paraparesis um, or, or paralyzed. Um, we can handle about five or six patients a day without crushing us. And that's you know, usually about twice a day therapies for each one of them because you have to put them in the tank, then they have to dry off, then they rest. We have another session in the afternoon. Okay? 
And each session lasts on average anywhere from a half an hour to an hour, an hour and a half. And it gets more and more labor intensive the less ambulatory they are or the more modalities you use. Does that answer your question? Okay. The other part, part of that is when we, talk, when we talk about charging. So there's various ways of charging for this when you get into practice. And um, different practices do it different ways. Um, some do it by modality. Okay? They'll say, they say, well, I'm going to put them in the tank. That's going to be usually about 75 US dollars okay? for you know, a half, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour. That, doesn't, that includes exercise time, drying time, et cetera. Um, and uh, usually t two sessions, okay? Um, and if I do acupuncture, that's about $120 uh, per acupuncture session. Um, or if I do just massage and assisted standing, that's about $60, okay? Um, but if you do that, it kind of adds up. And then you have owners saying, well, if I only do the massage and standing, today, can you do the underwater treadmill you know, next week? So then you have owners starting to make decisions based on finances on what you can or can't do. For me, um, I don't like that. I like to do what I need to do for the animal and what they need. So what I've done in the past two places where I've worked is set up a fee system that's based on time. Okay? So uh, we have a level one which is about 30 minutes, okay? We have a level two, which is about an hour. We have a level three that's an hour and a half, and a level four that takes about two hours per patient. And those are those huge Great Danes that are wobblers that are down, completely down, and it usually takes two people to manipulate, okay, and a long time to work through. Um, the level ones are our oncology patients. We have a lot of playtime patients that come in that um, they're in the hospital long term for radiation therapy, um, and we do a lot of massage and potentially some acupuncture for nausea and things like that on them. So it's very short sessions and, and very, fairly relatively inexpensive. So I'd, I'll do it by level, and then I'll do whatever I want to do within that time period um, in terms of therapies. I, re I would recommend B if you can in terms of just you doing the therapy and doing it by time. But you do have to count for the time, and it is expensive. Great question. Any other questions? Oh, hey. Uh, I didn't understand very well uh, what is done with patients that have bowel disease or urinary disease. Sure, no, that's really great. So we have... Um, a, a form when they want to have a consult with us and we have them check off do they have seizures, um, do they have urinary tract infections, do they have pneumonia, um, do they have bowel incontinence and if they check any of those boxes we are less likely to do water therapy. We won't do, we won't put them in the underwater treadmill, okay? What we can do, have interference, what we can do um, is put them in um, we have a very large sink, okay? So if it's a dachshund, if it's a schnauzer, if it's um, even, um, I'm spacing on the dog's breed, uh, up to about, you know, 20, 20 kigs, okay? We can put them in this tub of water, okay? And that will work well, and we can swim them, okay? We don't have the pool that you all have here, and actually I wouldn't put them in the pool. Um, so it does limit your ability for, for these. So we have to wait until they're fecally continent, and particularly if they have diarrhea, okay? You never want to put them in the tank, okay? Um, you know, if they have solid stools, potentially you can fish that out with a net. Um, you don't like to do that too often. That's more of an accident situation, right? So you can't put them in the lovely, beautiful, beautiful tank, but you can do other things. If they're huge, then you, do, you just can't. So then what we'll do is use land treadmill. And actually, that works really, really well. Okay, it really does, particularly if you have um, slings to support or people to hold slings. Um, you can do almost the same thing. Um, it's more labor intensive on your back. 
uh, but it works, it works well. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, okay. thank you. Yeah? Do you use aquatic therapy right after surgery? Because I read you should not because of incision. It's mm -hmm. a great question. I do, I do, and I'm very aggressive, okay? So um, the standard thing you see in all textbooks is you have to wait seven to 10 days until you get the sutures out, okay? Um, I will put animals in water as soon as 48 hours, 72 hours after surgery, okay? Because they have a fibrin seal of their incision and generally it's safer. Now, I look at my patient caseload, okay, um, that I have in the tank. Um, I'm, I'm very restrictive about and very protective about what I put in my tank. So I don't put in UTIs, I don't put in skin infections. Um, so my water is very clean and my uh, technical support people, they, they make sure the water culture's negative, okay, and they make sure that um, it's brominated and that our chemicals are at the appropriate levels. Um, so I know that my water is good, and so I have a lower risk of infection, but we spend a lot of time making sure the water is okay to do that. And if you have iffy water, wait. Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't put them in if you, you're not sure of your water or you don't have a good water maintenance plan, okay? The other thing you can do is use um, kind of like a, a gel seal of your, of your actual incisions um, and place it over there, like petroleum jelly and things like that um, as well. The one thing you'll note with any kind of chlorinated or brominated water um, is that the hair coat will become better Skin will become um, usually softer and better conditioned. So over time, the water therapy is actually very helpful for other things as well. Great question. You guys are more awake than I thought you would be. <laughs> this is great. Yes? I was wondering about the, the case of the cat yes. with the fracture. How long did it took to recover completely the motor yeah. Great functions? Great question. Four weeks. Four, Four weeks. weeks. And the cat was in the hospital for that period of time. Um, and it was, a, it was a great cat, a um, young cat. Um, but it's not uncommon for our cases that are severely, severely affected, severely paralyzed, that you have to lay out a plan. And like Dr. Olby said, most cases will get their function back within two weeks, okay, regardless of what we do, all right? Regardless of doing any of these things, these are nice. Um, but once you kind of get outside that two-week window and they're not improving, that's when you, you need to start having a talk with the owner about long-term, what it's going to take to deal with these patients. And actually, that's where I think rehab is very appropriate because it's that added extra choice beyond just take your animal home and hope for the best, right? Here's some things that we can proactively do to hopefully improve the chances, but ultimately it's gonna be up to the animal of what was the etiology of the disease, the severity, and all those things of if and when they're gonna recover. We will maximize it, but it ultimately boils down to the animal. You can't work miracles. But the cat was about four weeks. Did completely recover though. Um, and, but the, the, cave, you know, the caveat there was it didn't have any motor, but it had pain, right? Okay. You know, so that's the big thing. If it has pain, you got a much better chance um, of a recovery um, in, the, uh, in the, the shorter time period of a month to two months to three months. Thank you. Yeah. No one has a question. Thank you, Dr. Diane, for Thank the you. excellent lecture. Vamos fazer um intervalo e vamos regressar às 11, está bem? 15 minutos. Pedi a vossa atenção, vamos recomeçar a nova sessão uh, com, com a palestra da Dra. Olby, One Seen Never Forgotten. Uh, how to recognize unusual neurological syndromes e mais uma vez agradecer-lhe a sua presença Dr. Olby All right. Thank you very much. Good morning everybody. So I decided 
that I needed to show that I was English and I'm not afraid of the cold. Okay, so arms out, we'll see how that goes. All right, so this next session is a series, a collection of unique cases that honestly, if you have never seen them, you will see a case like this and you'll go, I have no idea what is wrong with your pet. But if you've seen it, then you know immediately what it is. So that's why I call it Once Seen, Never Forgotten. But before we start, oh, my daughter has appeared again. <laughs> now, I have a lot of dogs at home. And what happens is, rather like Dr. Dunning's technician, Joanne, I rescue dogs that are neurologic. And so I actually facilitate Joanne, her technician, rather a lot, and she gets quite angry at me because I encourage her. But unlike Joanne, I don't have six to ten dogs. At the moment, I have been up to six, but right now I'm only at three. And this is one of them. This is Lou. He's a beautiful Gordon Setter. And as it happens, he has cerebellar abiotrophy. And he is now ten years old, and so now he's got a bit more severely affected, and he spends a lot of time lying down. And so Izzy, my daughter, has figured out that he's a wonderful pillow. And he is incredibly tolerant of her. He will lie there while she climbs all over him. But typically what happens is we get home, he's lying there, and she gets something, and then she just snuggles up next to him. It's very, very sweet. But the other thing she does that is a little disconcerting to me as a mother, she really likes dog food. <laughs> she loves dog food. And so typically in a household where you have multiple dogs, you're trying to protect the dogs from each other so that they won't steal each other's food. In my household, I'm trying to protect my dogs from my daughter. Because she will just come in. You can see here, she's stealing the food. And she didn't realize I was right behind her and I could see. And when she saw, she's like, here, you have it. So generous, so generous. Oh, dear. Anyway, I do feed her proper human food. I do, I promise. There's something else I wanted to show you. And this really, I'm wondering if you can tell what this is. OK, it's a recipe. You have a glass, you put in a dash of Worcester sauce. Are you familiar with Worcester sauce? Very English thing. It's kind of a very savory, spicy sauce. A bit of brandy, a bit of brandy. Some pepper, clam juice. I don't know if that translates very well. Do you know what clams are? Like a shellfish? Yeah, kind of, ugh. It's a shellfish, ugh. Anyway, clam juice, I don't know. Tomato juice, and then a raw egg. Anybody know what that is? Yeah? Thought some of you might need it. It's a cure for a hangover. Yeah. This is actually the cure that uh, comes from the fictional character, Jeeves. Do you all know Jeeves? British butler book. He was the butler to Worcester, and uh, he would make him this for a hangover. Anyway, that probably goes over your heads. All right, so let's talk more about this. So I think for many people who are neurologists, in fact, I would say for all neurologists, one of the reasons they're a neurologist is they just love solving a puzzle, OK? So they like the neurolocalization game. They like the rules. They like looking at an animal and going, this is where the problem is, OK? So neuro is a game of localization. And in general, because each portion of the brain does a very specific thing, if you have a disease affecting that brain, you'll set, see a very specific set of signs. So for example, we've got a little dog here. Now, which part of the brain is affected in that dog? See the legs? Woo! Hypermetric gait. It's the cerebellum, yeah? This dog has cerebellar hypoplasia. However, we do see some disorders where you look at them and you go, I have no idea where this localizes. It doesn't follow those focal signs, okay, those rules. And some disorders just have a very unique constellation of signs, and we call them the once seen, never forgotten disorders. So I'm just going to show you a series of cases, and we'll talk about each one and see where you get. All right, so here's the first one. And this is a dog that presented because it will collapse when it exercised. It's a Labrador Retriever. All right, so here we are two minutes into the exercise, I hope. Yeah, very lovely Labrador. Very, very focus-driven dog. This dog, if you picked up a ball, this dog was going to run, you know? 
So here he is exercising. One little tip. If you have an owner present a case and say it collapses with exercise, always make the owner exercise that dog. Because otherwise, I find our students exercise it and exercise it, and the students collapse, and the dog is still fine. Okay? So we need the owner to do what, what they do. OK, so after two minutes, we did some nice running. Six minutes, huh. Dog seems a bit tired, but runs just as fast, OK? Just as fast, just as driven. Picked up the ball, but now instead of bringing the ball back to us, dog comes back, but then he avoids us and goes under the tree and sits down, OK? But he hasn't collapsed. Still running, and then the owner picks it up, and look, he's ready to go again. Panting pretty hard. You'd expect that. He's running pretty hard. And look, he runs just as fast again. OK? Just as fast. Comes on back. And now he is collapsed. So he's lying there, but all of a sudden he keels over. He's laterally recumbent, panting really hard. We're taking pulses, temperatures. We're getting blood samples to measure lactates. And now the owner's getting concerned. This is more of a collapse than he usually does. And we're about to rush him into ICU and give him fluids, a liter of fluids. Because this is more dramatic than she expected. And then he sits up, and you can see he's got this head wobble, this bobble of his head. I can tell you five minutes later, the dog was totally normal. Okay? So this would happen whenever the owner exercised the dog in that way. The dog was about two years old at this point. Very, very, very focused on the ball. Very driven to exercise. Okay? So, the other thing the owner said was, it's worse when it's hot. So where would we localize this problem? All right? We have a dog that is exercising and becoming paretic in all four legs, falls over, but has this head wobble. Seems very mentally appropriate, OK? Very mentally appropriate still, and rapidly recovers. So is this a generalized lower motor neuron disease? By that, is it the peripheral nerves and muscle, or junction? You know, we saw myasthenia gravis yesterday causes collapse. Is it spinal? I can tell you if this dog wasn't quite as collapsed as it was in that video, they get ataxic, particularly in their hind limbs. They get CP deficits. Okay? But we also saw that the dog had this real head bob that looked kind of cerebellar as well. Can we apply, can we localize this to one spot? And the short answer is no, we really can't. I would say this is generalized condition affecting the whole of the central nervous system. I don't think it looks peripheral. I think it looks more central. Okay? So very hard to localize it, very hard to come up with anything. You have to wonder if it's a metabolic problem because we have exercise and we have collapse. We also have this temperature issue. And so there was a lot of uh, interest over the temperature link, but in fact, well, it'll all be explained in a little minute. So, of course, we see something like this, and we will always do a bit of a me metabolic workup. And if you look at these dogs' muscle, it is completely normal. Okay? Looks very, very normal. If you look at them metabolically, there's a couple of things you see. If you measure their blood gases, they get a respiratory alkalemia. And that's because they're panting so hard, they're blowing off the carbon dioxide. So if, of course, a lot of these exercise-associated metabolic problems, we expect to see an acidemia. So this doesn't fit at all. Okay? This just seems to be a response to their panting. Classic way to look at a metabolic problem, you look at lactate and pyruvate. They're totally normal. And in fact, if you take their temperature is off the scale, but if you take a normal Labrador and you exercise it in the same way, their temperature is similarly off the scale. The temperatures are the same, OK? So histopathology of the entire dog, muscle, peripheral nerve, central nervous system, totally normal, OK? So we're not seeing a disease where there's neuronal death. And that makes sense, because these dogs are totally normal in between times. And if you have a lot of neuron death, you're not normal in between times, OK? Anybody know what this is? 
Anybody seen these cases? Because I know you see a lot of Labradors here. It's quite common in Labradors. So the disease is called exercise and collapse of Labrador retrievers. Not a very inventive name, not a very original name. Surely we could come up with something better. Um, but the cause and the disease pathophysiology has been figured out by figuring out the genetics. Okay? So Ned Patterson has um, his group have done the genetics and find a mutation in something called Dynamin 1. Okay? Dynamin 1 is a little protein, a little enzyme, a GTPase that is found throughout the central nervous system. And what it does is it allows synaptic vesicles to be formed. So if your vesicle forms from a membrane, it needs to split off from the membrane, and that's where dynamin comes in. Okay? So these animals have a generalized problem with synaptic transmission. It's mild enough that when they're just doing normal exercise, they're fine. Things get a little bit more intense, and they collapse. And they can die. It's pretty unusual. I think we came a little close with that Labrador. It's pretty unusual that they die, but every now and then they can. Okay? Quite an interesting disease. So what do we know about it? Um, we know so all the owners of these dogs say the signs are worse when it's hot. And when the research was done on normal Labradors, showing they went to the same temperature, there was this pushback from vets saying, no, no, you're imagining it. But it is absolutely true. When it's hot, they're worse. If you cool them down, they improve much more quickly. So if you get a water hose on them quickly, they improve more quickly. What's very interesting is researchers working on Drosophila, fruit flies, they have put similar mutations into these fruit flies. And there are wonderful videos on YouTube, of fruit flies in a jar flying around. They warm the jar up a little, they all drop to the bottom. Cool it off again, they all start flying again. Okay. So clearly there is some effect of temperature on the um, penetrance, if you like, of this mutation. So we know in Minnesota, 37% of Labradors are carriers. That's really high. It's an autosomal recessive disease, and so once you see about 30-40%, you see a lot of the cases. At the moment, they're working on the um, prevalence of it worldwide. Find the same mutation in Chesapeake Bay retrievers and curly coat retrievers. So if you see any animals that collapse, that are Labradors, that are retrievers, you can do this genetic test in Minnesota. How do you treat it? You don't exercise them to that point. And what I found, and I think has also been reported, is every case that I see that's like this is a dog that's totally crazy about chasing a ball. They're agility dogs, they're dogs that really that dog should have just stopped way earlier. But it was willing, it wanted to keep on exercising beyond the point where it collapsed. A more sensible Labrador retriever would have collected the, the ball a couple of times and said, okay, that's enough, thank you very much. Okay? So definitely personality plays into it. What's interesting is border collies have a similar thing, but it's not the same mutation. They're working on the genetics of that. So I just wanted to show you another one that's a little bit more mild so you can see how they can look um, when they're not quite collapsed. So this is a home video, and you can see this dog's been exercising for 10 minutes, and you see how it looks kind of spinal. Looks ataxic and tetraparetic, worse in the hind limbs, almost looks a bit hypermetric. So we kind of think with all this exercise, either it's just the body heat that is making the signs clinical, or it's that they are using more neurotransmitter. So then that always begs the thought for me is if the dog sits and thinks really hard, will it faint? Because it's using a lot of energy. I don't know. Apparently not. Apparently Labradors don't think that hard. So this dog's gradually become laterally recumbent. And what it needs now is some cooling water. But this was not here, what was not at our clinic. This was at home. And they just videotaped it. <laughs> Videotaped him. We actually had a very long videotape that I edited somewhat. Um, but just to show you, after five minutes, getting up again, still a bit wobbly, still a little bit weak, but much, much, much better. Okay? So that's a pretty dramatic phenotype. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty much a worldwide phenotype, so don't be surprised if you see one of those. Okay. Now we get on to paroxysmal disorders. Does that word translate well? Paroxysmal? Acute, sudden, dramatic craziness. 
All right, this is, a, this is a good one. This is a disease I happen to be working on the genetics of. So here's a rather odd-looking Cairn Terrier. And these episodes will come on with exercise or with excitement. There it goes. No, you're not meant to laugh. Or at least not in front of the clients. Now, ooh, he has a little collision with the wall. Oh, dear. Whoa. Anybody seen anything like this before? OK, it's another disorder that's relatively common in its breed. It's a disorder called Scotty Cramp. So the only problem with that was that wasn't a Scotty. If I'd shown a Scotty, you would have all got that immediately, wouldn't you? Um, so it can also occur in Cairn Terriers. It's most prevalent in Scottish Terriers. Occasionally occurs in Westies. Occasionally occurs in, in Cairn Terriers. So how do we classify this? And again, I can tell you after five minutes, that dog will be totally normal. So is it a metabolic problem? It's exercise and excitement induced. So again, do we have some sort of metabolic problem? But did you see the spasticity? You saw how it got very spastic and increased tone. It didn't get floppy. Um, so if you have spasticity, is that coming from the muscle, like a myotonia, like I showed you yesterday, that dog with the muscles that would contract when you percuss them? Does it come from the spinal cord, like tetanus, for example, is a spasticity happening at spinal cord level? Or is it coming from the brain? Is it driven from the brain? Very hard to know. Is it a seizure? Did it look like a seizure to you guys? No. Really didn't look like a seizure, did it? We could run an EEG and prove it, but it wasn't a seizure. So the theory has been this is some sort of generalized neurotransmitter ion channel problem, something like that. Again, a generalized problem throughout the nervous system. Um, histopathologically, they look totally normal. So if you look at muscle, totally normal. If you work them up metabolically, totally normal. Histopathic brain, totally normal. So again, that tells us it's not a disease of neuron death. It's probably a disease of how neurons talk to each other, how neurons function. So ion channels, neurotransmitters, OK? That's kind of what we think. There is some potential link to serotonin. If you increase serotonin, you improve them. If you decrease it, their signs worsen. But that could just be a secondary effect, OK? May be significant, may not be. We're not sure. It's supposedly autosomal recessive. Supposedly, I've been working with the Scottish Terrier Breed Society on a couple of diseases. And they said to me, Dr. Olby, would you please work out the genetics of Scotty Cramp? They've had, it's been recognized since the 1940s. It's a really old disease. They say it's a really common problem in our breed. You will get lots of blood samples. So I wrote this grant. We will get the blood samples in a year. We'll do the genetic stuff the next year. It's not common anymore. So I really struggled to get, I wanted to get 50 good affected dogs. I really struggled. So there's two things that happen. One is that it's not as common as it used to be. And the other is that now within that breed, any dog that holds a leg up in any way, the owners say, oh, it's got Scotty Cramp, when it really doesn't. Okay, so it's, it's actually not as common as they think. There are similar diseases in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. This is called episodic falling. That's pretty common in the UK. We don't see it so often in the US. Um, this one, they found out the mutation. It's a mutation in something called Brevican, which is thought to stabilize synapses. So it is related to synaptic transmission again, just like the last one, the Labrador Retriever one. Uh, Scotties don't have this mutation. There have been other reports in other breeds as well. Okay? So it's certainly out there. There are all kinds of similar diseases in people as well. Uh, but just to show you, this is a little bit what my household is like. Okay, so here is a Scottish Terrier, an adorable Scottish Terrier, who was given to me to euthanize because she was meant to have cerebellar disease. But she really doesn't. She's got this incredible spasticity. This little dog now lives with me. This is about four years ago. And you can see how spastic she is. You see she's up on her tippy toes and her tail even become spastic at times. Look at that. But it's a bit odd because this dog is like it all the time. Whereas Scotty Cramp, they're very normal in between. 
they have an episode, they're very normal again. So this little girl is abnormal all the time. In other words, in the Scottish Terrier breed, there are a lot of weird movement disorders that are difficult to distinguish and classify and that we've done a pretty poor job of describing as veterinarians at the moment. I wish I could fast forward this videotape because the reason this little dog, so what happened is I brought this dog back to the vet school to euthanize. I went and collected her from the owners because they said she's so bad because of, of her cerebellar disease we want to euthanize her and we'd be happy for you to look at her brain and I'm not very good at euthanizing dogs to be honest and uh, anyway I brought her back and I looked at her and I'm like she looks more like a Scotty Cramp so if we treat her appropriately with Valium then maybe she'll improve she can go back to the owners so I called the owners said I have a, had a good look at your dog and maybe she'll be able to come back to you maybe she'll respond to Valium or something and they said oh we've already got another puppy you need to keep her <laughs> that was like probably three hours after I picked her up I kid you not um, so anyway, I did. I took her home over the weekend to just try her with Valium, which can treat Scotty Cramp quite effectively. And when I got her home, she, once she got out in the field and started to exercise, her signs actually improved. So she was the opposite of a Scotty Cramp. She has this spasticity most of the time, but once she exercises, she does pretty well. Now here we're looking at her postural reactions that are pretty normal. She doesn't have CP deficits. She can hop. She's got excellent strength. There she's doing moon hopping, I think. <laughs> but here she is in the, in the field. And of course, once I saw her running around the field, I couldn't euthanize her because she was so happy. So she still lives with us. And she hasn't got any worse. So she'll get going. And what you're going to see is another dog's going to come into the picture. This other dog is an American Staffordshire Terrier, Rosie, who has cerebellar disease. So when you compare the two, you can see that she looks very different to the cerebellar dog. Look how happy she is. She's a real terrier, sniffing around, looking for rabbits. <laughs> So she figured out how to run, and there's Rosie. <laughs> and as we watch, see Rosie? Rosie's all, Rosie falls over. Zoe doesn't fall over so much. Zoe bounces, Rosie falls over. Whoa, off she goes. <laughs> so you see they look quite different. Okay, enough of that. So the take-home message is Scotty Cramp is that very, very specific, look at that mid-jump, isn't that great? Very, very specific disorder, but there are a whole load of other movement disorders within Scottish Terriers that we don't really know what they are, okay? So we're working on the mutation for Scotty Cramp right now. All right, now we've got one that's totally different. This is a, ooh, I would say she's about a five-year-old, female spade Doberman Pinscher and probably about eight weeks prior to this, maybe even longer than that, she'd been in a car that was in a car accident, okay? And she got out of the car from the car accident, no problem, she looked really normal but very shortly after that she started to snatch up one leg and hold that leg up. And the vet couldn't really find anything wrong, um, sent her to our orthopedic service and they wondered if she had some sort of muscle tear or something, because she would just hold this leg up. And the dog kind of came and went a few times, and then the other leg started to do it. And one of the orthopedic surgeons, Bruce Nwadike, before your time, he was like, Natasha, have you seen this dog? Oh my goodness, I was so happy to see this dog, because again, it's got a specific syndrome. So look at this dog walk. You need to focus on a few things. See, it's walking pretty well. It's got, it's got pretty thin muscle in the distal hind limb, the gastrocnemius in particular. You can see it's walking pretty well, but now it stops and look what it's doing. Shifting weight, shifting weight. Oh, it's holding up a leg. 
As I say, it's a little bit hard to tell, but there is quite a lot of muscle atrophy, particularly over the gastroc. Holding up that leg, orthopedically, that leg's really sound. You can't find anything. Holding it up. And then it'll do a little dance, dance, dance. Okay, now it's going to try to sit down and, ooh, no, don't like that. Stand up again. Then it's going to sit on one hip. Ah, okay, now I'm comfortable. Isn't that odd? Again, it is a classic, classic syndrome. Anybody know what it's called? It's got a wonderful name, unlike the exercise-induced collapse. It's called dancing Doberman disease. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> like this, okay? These guys walk pretty well, but you ask them to stand, and they really have a problem with it. Okay, so how do we localize that? So we consider it's a disease of the lumbar spinal cord. They don't have CP deficits. They know where those feet are. They're not ataxic when they walk. They do get a little bit weak, okay? But they don't have other signs of spinal cord disease. Are the sciatic nerves involved? You know, they have atrophy of the gastrocnemius. Um, their reflexes remain pretty good. Is it a neuromuscular junctional disease? I don't know. Could it be a disease of muscle? All right, so it's a little bit odd. So if you look at things, um, we say both hind limbs are affected. They almost always start with one hind limb, and then the other one goes. But the one that starts first tends to remain the most severely affected. Okay. They really have difficulty maintaining posture when they stand. And that is a hallmark of disease of motor neurons. Have you guys ever seen a horse with equine motor neuron disease? Familiar with that disease? Yeah, they can't stand. So ask them to walk, they're okay. You get them to stand in a stable and they start to shake and they, you know, they, they go down. So maintaining posture requires your alpha motor neurons. And if you lose out those motor neurons, you get that weakness, that inability to maintain a posture. Dog looks uncomfortable, doesn't it? It looks like it's in pain, particularly when it tried to sit down and then move. You examine it, you can't identify any pain, but we can't have a conversation. We can't say, do you have pins and needles, for example. We, we just can't tell that, so we're limited in our assessment of pain from that point of view. We definitely do see muscle atrophy of the gastrocnemius, and that, of course, is innervated by sciatic nerve. Okay. So really this is, it's been shown to be a disease of the lower motor neuron. It's autosomal recessive. Anywhere from six months to seven years in onset. Histopathology does fit with the neuropathy. Has a very slow progression. And usually that dog is about as bad as they get. And so they do okay. There's no treatment. I do wonder, I haven't seen a case for a number of years. I do wonder if treating them for neuropathic pain with a drug like gabapentin might change their behavior a little bit about the sitting down and the snatching the leg up. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I haven't been able to try that because I haven't had any cases for a while. But a fascinating disease, a little bit like string halt in horses, where they'll hold a, hold a leg up. OK, anybody ever seen one of the dobies like that? Now, I should just say, if any of you see a Scottish Terrier with Scotty Cramp, Please get in touch with me. I want some DNA, OK? I want some DNA. All right, here's a six-year-old German Shepherd dog. And we actually see quite a few of these cases. Now, you know German Shepherds get gait abnormalities all the time. I want you to focus on this leg here. We're holding up the tail purely so that you could see the leg. That was the only reason. It's not because it's weak. Here's the leg. What do you think of that? Anybody seen anything like that? I'm going to show it you again. So do you see ataxia? No. It's doing a strange thing, but what it's doing that's strange is in the air, yeah? When it strikes the ground, it's, it's going pretty straight. So it comes forward, it stops short, and it smacks back down onto the ground. If you to do a neuro exam, there are no CP deficits. There's no hopping deficits. There's no loss of strength. There's no paresis. Anybody seen that before? No? OK. So what's the cause? Is it Achilles rupture? Is it because the dog has lumbosacral disease? We talked about that a bit yesterday. Maybe a lateral patella luxation. 
Or could it be a muscle contracture? What do you think? So, number one, Achilles rupture. Anybody go for that? No, nope. staying very quiet. What would you see with an Achilles rupture? You would see the hock drop. Yeah, so that doesn't really fit. LS disease. Could this be a lumbosacral disease with compression of the sciatic nerve? <coughs> Anybody like that one? No, no, it doesn't really fit very well with that either. Okay. Might it have LS disease as well? Sure, it's a German Shepherd, it might, but that doesn't usually cause that abnormality. What about lateral patella luxation? Is that making the dog use its limb differently? It kind of gets more intriguing, doesn't it? But it doesn't look right for that. It's moving, it's stifled very well. So that leaves us with muscle contracture. Okay, so this dog has a muscle contracture. So what you're seeing is a mechanical stop to the limb. As the limb comes forwards, something is stopping it completing that movement and hitting the ground. And we see fibrosis of any of these muscles of the medial thigh, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, the gracilis, can be any of those muscles. And they fibrose and form this incredible band. It almost feels like a tight elastic band. So the way we diagnose them is we stand them straight and we palpate their medial thighs. And you can literally feel this muscle band. Usually it's a bilateral disease, but it starts on one side first. So you'll often feel the band on both sides, but more obvious on one side. What you need to do is then go and feel another dog, because you don't feel the thighs in that way every day. So I usually find I go and feel, and I go, oh yeah, I can feel that band. Then I go, well, maybe I'm inventing it because I want it to be there. So I go and feel another dog and just make sure it feels really different. Okay, so the theory behind it is, you know this, if you go to a dog show, and you watch German Shepherds in the show ring, those dogs are like walking along like this. They're like, oh my goodness, they're crazy. They all look really, really abnormal to me, but that's the desirable phenotype. This dog shows that really pretty well, okay? And so the theory is that that very low carriage of the pelvis is causing micro trauma to those medial muscles, and so they fibrose. Treating it, it's really frustrating. It seems like you could just cut that band and they'd be fine. They just fibrose up again. Um, there is a group in Auburn that will do very dramatic resections of all of the fibrotic muscle and then do very intensive rehab to try and prevent that fibrous band from reforming. And anecdotally, they say they've had some success. They've never published it. Truth is, it's a non-painful disease. It's not progressive beyond that. So the dog's not going to be a show dog. And even if you did major surgery on it, it's unlikely to be a show dog. So we just tell people not to worry about it, really. OK, here's another one. Just about at the end now. 12-year-old miniature pincher, OK? You know, some people will say, my dog's got a really severe problem. They come in and you can't see anything. We have some people who are the exact opposite. The owner's brought this dog in saying, it's walking a little strangely. Are you kidding me? Yes, it's walking very strangely. Okay, so here's this rather sad looking miniature pincher. And he's got this very, very stiff gait. He also looks very strange. Not the best specimen. So here we're looking at CPEs. And you see his weight isn't being supported properly. If he supports his weight properly, he'll flip, flip his foot just fine. He's lost a lot of hair. He's got a pot belly. The owner said he hadn't noticed him drinking a lot, but he'd just adopted this dog. I can tell you, we could not keep a water bowl full in his cage. He was drinking so much. If you look at his reflexes, it's a little bit hard to tell from this video, to be honest. He had good patellar reflexes. He was a little bit weak on the withdrawal. His skin had areas that were really crusty and thick. And then in other areas, which I think we're going to see in a minute, the skin had totally lost elasticity. Look at that. So what disease does this dog have? Cushing's disease. Yeah, well done. This dog's got Cushing's disease. But when you watch the dog, all four legs are abnormal. Hind limbs are much more worse than the forelimbs. There was no spinal ataxia, and the CPs were normal when the weight was supported correctly. Withdrawals were a little weak, the patellar reflexes were normal. Definitely, as the dog was walking, he wasn't really flexing his stifles, and he lost uh, elasticity, and his crusty areas in his skin were calcinosis circumscripta because of his Cushing's disease. 
So do you think this is due to muscle, joints, or nerve? Muscle? Yes, no, hands up. Joints? Nerve? Staying safe? Abstaining? It's a disease of muscle. It's called a Cushing's myopathy. It's pretty unusual. We probably see the cases. You know, they come in probably to neurology services. Um, but it's meant to be less than 5% of Cushingoid dogs. And it does also get called pseudomyotonia. We really don't know why some dogs do this, but they get this inability to relax their muscles, so they get this very spastic gait. And this little dachshund's quite a good example of it. This dachshund belonged to a vet student, had poorly controlled Cushing's disease, had blown a disc, had bilateral cruciate surgery, and then came up with this because it was Cushingoid. So you see how stiff he is? And again, he was a poorly controlled Cushingoid. So the gait can be pretty dramatic, as you saw in the miniature pincher. And um, it's something to be aware of. We have a neurology listserv for neurologists. And recently, a newly minted diplomat posted a video of a dachshund just like this saying, I really don't understand what's wrong with this dachshund. It's like, oh, <laughs> she hadn't seen one of these ones before. It's, it's a very classic presentation. OK, we've got a couple more short things I want to show you. This is actually a Siamese cat. I don't know why I say domestic short hair. This is a very acute onset of this problem. Watch the head movements. Here we are outside. This cat would walk on a leash. Look at the head movements, crazy head movements. And then watch this cat try to walk. Now, those head movements are pathognomonic for this disease, OK? And then very ataxic, rolls and falls to both sides. Anybody know what it has? So um, it's got, it has bilateral vestibular disease, OK? So with cats, they can get an idiopathic vestibular disease, just like dogs. But it can absolutely affect both sides at the same time. And they classically will have this Stevie Wonder head thing, OK? So if you start to see this great big head roll, coupled with an ataxia like that, it's got bilateral vestibular disease. So you need to examine the ears, make sure you don't find anything. I have certainly seen cats that have had bilateral otitis media and things like that. But usually, you don't find anything. And it's an idiopathic condition. Uh, definitely, Siamese are predisposed. Um, does seem to be somewhat seasonal. And uh, certainly, all your classic signs of vestibular disease that you look for, head tilt and nystagmus, they're not there because it's a bilateral problem. Okay? So I think that's what fools people with that one. Here's another one. This is an unusual breed to show you it. Look at this. So this dog's looking around. It'll respond to us. It'll walk around. No problem, but it's got these head tremors, these fine head tremors. More typical breeds, this might help you, would be the Bulldog and the Doberman Pinscher. Boxer, Labrador, they're the breeds we see more often. Now look what we're doing. We're getting it to focus on something. We do that with any tremor to see if it's worse with focusing, which would mean it's cerebellar, or not. And when you look at this particular one, you get it to really focus on a treat, the tremors go away. So it's not an intention tremor. You can actually stop this by getting the animal to focus on something. Anybody seen anything like that? This is a disease we call idiopathic head tremor syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you always find them neurologically normal. We often have these animals come into us on anti-epileptic drugs and having failed to respond to them, because it's not a seizure. They don't respond to an anti-epileptic drug. But if you fit, get them to fixate on something, they'll stop. Classic bulldogs, beagles, dobermans. But again, we see labradors, we see boxers. Workup's usually normal. So we don't yet understand this disease. And hopefully, someone will work on the genetics of it and figure that one out. Um, really doesn't cause the animal much problem. Really not a bad disease to have. OK. Here's another tremor case. Little white dog. And the elderly lady who owned this dog brought the dog in and said she thought the dog had seen the devil. Okay? 
And you can see why she says that. Look at that anxious face. And he's got generalized tremors. Look, he's got hypermetric gait. Okay? And look at that. Look at these eyes bouncing around. We call that opsoclonus. He will also, and he's getting worse as he's focusing on us, he's getting worse. So he's got an intention tremor. So this looks much more cerebellar. That is not the correct way to do a menace, by the way, just in case you were wondering. And then we have both the opsoclonus, the bouncing around randomly, and we also, the dog, were going to vertical nystagmus. So all of those signs, this is a young dog, all of those signs really localized to the cerebellum. And if you work them up, they look pretty normal. Sometimes on MRI you see a little inflammation in the cerebellum. On your CSF tap you find inflammation. And this is a disease um, that we call, let's just whip across that. Classically we call little white shakers, okay? Nice name to remember, very easy to remember. The trouble is we see it in dogs that aren't white as well. So that could mislead you. We see Dachshunds, we see Boston Terriers, but we do see a lot of Maltese, a lot of Westies and breeds like that can call it cerebellitis, generalized tremor syndrome. It responds to immunosuppression, okay? It responds well to immunosuppression. Okay, I wanted to, I'm going to actually go across that and just jump to this last case. Okay, so this cat is actually improving dramatically at this point, several weeks out from when it presented, but it still shows pretty interesting signs. Cute little kitten that had a gradual onset of this spasticity in the hind limbs, tail, and kind of trunk, if you like. And if you look at this, as we try to flex and extend the limbs, when it first presented, you literally could not flex and extend them. Now it's got a range of motion that's abnormal, but improving. Anybody know what that is? We sometimes will see it in one fallen, in cats. In dogs, it would affect the whole dog. It's got focal tetanus, okay? So tetanus, as you all know, produces spasticity, <coughs> sore horse posture, pretty dramatic, but cats are much more resistant to clostridial toxins than dogs, so they can get a tetanus that is just affecting the limb that's closest to the source of the tetanus toxin, okay? Um, and so in this particular cat, it was the caudal half of the body. Um, it actually got a diaphragmatic hernia. It had all kinds of problems from it, and it, but it did recover well. But we definitely see cats that come in with one forelimb that's just rigid, and they will recover over time. You need to find the wound. You need to treat them with antibiotics um, and use rehabilitation to try and gradually increase range of motion in those limbs, okay? So just something for you to know. Cats can just be one part of their body. Okay, so I hope now you can recognize some of these syndromes. And what I would say to you is if you see something that's really weird, call your local neurologist, okay? There's a neurologist right here, isn't there? So call them uh, because they may be able to tell you immediately what it is based on the signs and the breed, okay? And uh, remember that if you can't localize it, it probably does have a more generalized problem, and that's why it's hard. Okay, so here this says, I like this a lot. Wait a minute here, Mr. Crumley. Maybe it isn't kidney stones after all. He's got a rhinoceros horn in his back. Um, make sure you look at the whole patient, I guess. <laughs> okay, anybody have any questions? Anybody seen anything weird and wonderful they want to discuss? No? All right, thank you very much. Bem, vamos, vamos continuar com a próxima palestra intitulada Re Rehabilitation Case Studies of the Neurological Patient with a, com a Dr. Diane Dunning. Thank you again, Dr. Dunning. You may start whenever you want. All right, good. Can you hear me well? All right. Last lecture before lunch. You're almost there, okay? 
We are going to talk about some cases that are neurologic, and some, most of them are actually, again, Dr. Olby's, um, and what we did with them in rehab. And I think you'll find this pretty interesting, or at least I hope you will. But before we go there, I didn't have videos that worked the last time I talked to you, so I wanted to make sure that you saw this. So uh, here's that little poodle in the underwater treadmill there um, with that kind of more hypermetric gait, again, picking its paws out of the water, versus a land treadmill. Still a pretty kinetic gait, active gait, but you know, this is mostly from the front. I think we're going to transition here to the side, maybe. There we go. You can see, though, that the stifles and the coxofemoral joints aren't really going through that active range of motion that they are in the water. So you really can vary the stride um, with your patients depending upon the modality you use. Here's swimming, okay, um, in a dog that has pretty significant uh, paraparesis. And you can see them in the, in the front here. And this is just to show you kind of the level you have to put the animals in to get them to start swimming, okay? And they, they really, they kind of have to be a little bit anxious about this, not horribly scared that they think they're going to go underwater, but enough to feel like they have to try, okay? So you can prepare to get wet too, okay? Here's from the rear, and this is why I love water, okay? So here is the dog that you were seeing nothing on land. But if you can visualize, you see the point, the point, hey, there it is. Um, the point of the right rear is actually starting to move under the water there. It helps if I use a pointer there. You can see it start moving back and forth. Whereas the left, there's not much there yet. But we're getting there, and that's a very positive sign. Okay. Again, a little bit of a struggle. But we're not, we're not letting the head go underwater. We're trying to keep the nose out of the water, although the, I think that she may have surfaced under there a little bit. Tails are great, okay? They're a wonderful self-installed handle, okay? Um, make sure that they don't have LS disease before you do this, because that can hurt, okay, lumbosacral disease. But in these little guys, sometimes it's better than a sling um, to hold on to the tail, as long as it's not painful, okay? You guys were so interested in the cat. Remember that cat that I showed you that was paralyzed in the rear? This is in week one. And we used a lot of facilitated play. People came by and said, you're just playing with a cat. What are you doing? Well, what we were doing is we were trying to get the cat more up and mobile. And we tried several different things. The slings were too large to be around the way, so we actually had to tie a little tie, trying to get him up and mobile. He doesn't have much there yet, but we're getting there, right? This is only week one. Here's week two and a half. And just wait for it. <gasps> oh, wow. OK, we were doing underwater therapy throughout this whole thing as well. So anytime they fall down, you pick them back up. You steady their feet in appropriate position. Fall down again, pick them back up. Laser pointers also work really well on the floor with cats. We use that a lot, OK? Doesn't project as well. OK, here's for the magic moment. Four weeks. Oh, man, we're good. <laughs> All right, not normal, but significantly better. So when you work with them, their etiology is resolving, right? We're not, you know, we're not laying hands on them and curing them. They have a disease that can be cured, but we're facilitating things, OK? Here's the cheater. OK, watch this. Okay, he's kind of going along, moving that little leg there, but watch, he's going to go to the side. Okay, there we go. Now, it looks like he's doing something, but he's not. All right, so then we pull him back to the middle, and he goes, okay. All right, I'm going to come over here. I'm going this side. All right, I'm standing. Oh, I'm going to move. At any rate. So just watch him. They will cheat, okay? Lazy, lazy. Just a few more things about our program. We actually have a mobile animal hospital very pretty, um, that we actually go into areas in North Carolina that do not have veterinary care, and we take our students. And the students have to sign up for this, um, and they actually have to
that for a service rotation into their community. This is a fully operable um, surgical suite inside. Uh, we have a prep room and uh, three OR bays, very tight quarters, uh, but our surgeons go out with our students. This is actually a, a child. They're not, we're not that young like you guys are. Um, and we do spay, we usually do a lot of um, feral cats, spay and neuters, but we also do triage procedures and vaccine clinics, et cetera. This is the large animal hospital, okay? We showed you the small animal. This is all the large animal hospital. We have an equine program associated with our college that's very strong. We also have a satellite clinic down in uh, the southern part of North Carolina in Southern Pines where we have quarantine facilities and we provide outreach to the community there. We have a very strong equine ophthalmology program with, uh, led by Brian Gilger here. Um, that actually goes around all throughout the state, as well as a strong equine orthopedic uh, program. This is Dr. Redding doing arthroscopy on a horse. A great theriogenology program as well. And someone asked about our bioprosthesis program. This is Dr. Uh, Marcellin Little. Um, and he actually, his area of specialty, he has a few, one obviously rehab, I don't know if you've read any of his, his work, but he is uh, probably the foremost ex, uh, expert on ring fixtures and angular limb deformities, but his real love is a bioprosthesis. So he's actually created an osteointegrated prosthesis that becomes a part of a person or an animal's body. And he's working with the Department of Defense with, unfortunately, all these conflicts that we have going on right now of people losing limbs and providing a model in animals um, for people for limb replacement. We have a strong exotic and wildlife service, and we saw all your flight and rehab facilities. Um, we work with wolves. We work with all the aquaria. We work uh, with the museums with their live animal exhibits. And this is Dr. Stolskoff here. Uh, working with our red wolves in North Carolina. Who's that? <laughs> oh, that's Dr. Olby. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> I'm her number one fan. And after this lecture, I'm the president of her fan club. And if you'd like to join her fan club, you can come see me. But just remember, I'm president. You'd have to be, you know, vice president or something like that. <laughs> okay? So we're going to talk about two cases, um, the first one being Barry and the second one being Baxter. Okay, this is Barry. He's very cute. Okay. Barry was a 10-year-old castrated German Shepherd. All right. He had a three-month history of progressive neurologic deterioration that was very subtle at first. Um, he would knuckle, cross his limbs, become mildly weak and ataxic. And he was brought into his veterinarian who very appropriately evaluated him, deemed him, you know, really not at a level where he needed further referral or even surgical intervention or being seen by a neurologist, and treated him with conservative therapy, which he sort of responded but kind of stayed at that same level until he started getting worse. And that was pretty much over the last month. And so he also began defecating in the house um, inappropriately, um, as it would be inappropriate to defecate in the house, period. Okay, there he is. Look at that. Oh, he's a big boy. He's about 41.1 kilograms. Not fat, just a big, big German Shepherd. He was very, very alert, responsive, and bright. His um, TPR was essentially normal, his temperature pulse and uh, <laughs> respiration. And the rest of the physical exam was normal, including the rectal exam, which was pretty important. Um, the anal tone was present, the feces were soft, normal. There was no blood um, or digested blood or blood in the uh, feces and the prostate was normal. On his initial neurologic assessment, he was deemed as mentally appropriate, bright, alert, and responsive. In terms of looking at his posture and his gait, he was diagnosed with ambulatory tetraparesis. He had strong motor but he had proprioceptive ataxia in all four limbs, lateralizing more to the right than to the left, okay? And so he had worse scuffing of his toes. On palpation, they also noted muscle atrophy over the right scapula, probably due to the length of the time that this has been going on. His postural reactions were markedly delayed in both hind limbs um, and in the right fore. 
And in terms of the cranial nerves, uh, spinal reflexes and sensation, sensation, that was normal. He was also completely non-painful or, or deemed non-painful. So based upon that neuro exam, the neurologist located his lesion to C5, T2, okay? And they did cervical radiographs and MRI, and on that they diagnosed a mildly compressive intervertebral disc protrusion at 5, 6, and a pretty significant right dorsal spinal cord compression at 5, 6. And there's the lesion, okay? So on surgery, they're still in neurology, mind you. He had a dorsal cervical laminectomy at C5-6, and following surgery, Barry was remarkably weaker in all four limbs and became non-ambulatory. Now, lest you think there's something going awry here, most dogs get worse. They even get worse with diagnostic imaging. That's why you never proceed with any of the diagnoses until you're sure the owners are gonna proceed with some kind of treatment, because there's always a risk. Okay? And 70% of them, it's common, you know, it's temporary, and they get better. Okay? But that first 24, 48 hour window sometimes can be scary. Okay? However, Barry didn't get better. Okay? He's non ambulatory at this point, um, and they, so much so that the neurologist repeated the MRI four days later. Okay? And they were worried that potentially something happened at the surgery site or that he was bleeding, that he had a hematoma there that was follow, having some kind of compression and there wasn't anything. He just was worse, okay? So he was referred at this point to our rehab service for treatment, okay? Because they were really realizing at this point that there was nothing more they can do than tincture of time and then potentially some intervention. Okay. So, the one thing I haven't told you yet is that this patient is a guide dog um, for a blind donor, okay? So it is of paramount importance that this dog get better, okay? Um, and our rehab assessment confirmed what they found in neurology, that he was tetraparetic, he was worse on the right side, okay? And he was non-ambulatory. His pain was well controlled. He had a fentanyl patch, actually he had two of them on given that he was such a big dog. Um, and he was be being given carprofen. I'm gonna stop this just for a second just because I don't think this video is gonna work. I'm gonna show you this one. So this is Barry on the first day. For whatever reason, some of my videos don't work, so I'm gonna show you. It's very short, but there he is in all his glory. Okay? And another thing you should know about Barry is he's pretty lazy. For a guide dog, this dog, he was very happy just laying around. Okay? And, we, you know, this is something that's pretty interesting that I've noted over the years is there are some dogs that want to get up, and then there's others that are very happy being carried around. And ironically, Barry was one of them, and he actually was letting his blind owner carry him around everywhere. Um, <laughs> instead of maybe assisting him. So he, he was, he's quite content. He's a, he's a funny little thing. Okay. Oh, okay, there we go. On gait assessment, he was unable to ambulate without assistance. He was significantly worse on his forelimbs than in his hind. And his bilateral forelimbs had this extensor rigidity to them. Minimal motor function and, and no proprioception, okay? And he was worse on the right than the left. We looked at his pain score, because that's really important to make sure that before we start manipulating, we're not gonna hurt him, okay? We're not gonna make anything worse. And he did not have um, any pain appreciable. And he was pretty happy. The other thing that we want to look at with this guy, particularly Coretic, is kind of any other risk factors, because this dog is spending the majority of his time down in lateral recumbency, okay? So the things that we look at, and, and neurology is very good about this, and they, you know, uh, we work with them, is we look at certain things such as, can he move his chest wall? Is he breathing okay? Is there evidence of pneumonia, okay? And he could move his chest wall. He didn't have any evidence of pneumonia, no evidence of regurgitation after surgery and the multiple anesthesias. 
Was he a risk factor for aspiration? Well, yes, he was, mostly because he was recumbent, but all these other things were not in play. So we weren't worried about megaesophagus. We weren't worried about pharyngeal dysfunction, laryngeal paralysis, which you sometimes can see in older animals, um, and he had no history of regurgitation. The other thing that we really check on these guys that we know have been down for a while and are going to be down is we do a daily decubital ulcer check okay, on them, particularly over the bony prominences. And we make sure that the bedding that they have is appropriate. And we have a lot, we were very fortunate, we have a lot of very thick padded bedding that we install in the caging. We also flip them every two to four hours as well and get them up in slings. So Barry's problem list, as you can guess, is that he is non-ambulatory tetraparetic. He has extensor rigidity in the forelimbs. He's got risk factors for decubital ulcers and aspiration. And he's got some disused muscle, muscle atrophy, which was found prior to his referral to rehab. So what are we going to do about this? For the tetraparesis, we're going to go ahead and use some assisted standing with some hoist slings and therapy balls. I'm going to show you all those. For his extensive rigidity, we're using passive range of motion, mostly just to relax the rigidity. We're not worried about the joints here. And massage to loosen him up. For the risk factors, we are going to provide this general supportive care that I just spoke to you about. And for the atrophy, once we get him up, we're going to get him active, OK? But you'll see, he doesn't really care too much for that. OK, here he is on a day two, OK? We have him on the ball, okay? And he's up there, he's very nice. He just doesn't want to do very much of anything, okay? You can see the uh, extensor rigidity of the forelimbs. Okay, sorry, I was drinking that morning as well, it seems like. Um, and he's suspended. He's got a lot of weight taken off of him from the sling and a substan the rest of it taken off from the ball. So he is not bearing much weight at all. So theoretically, if he could move, he should move, but he's just not showing much of anything here. Okay, that was on day two. Equipment needed for something like this are therapy balls. We talked about this previously. They come in all shapes and sizes. I would encourage you to invest in at least a small, medium, and large ball. We also have extra large balls and peanuts. We have the most wonderful hoist, which I, in the beginning, resisted us buying because it was about $3,000, not including the slings. But this thing is a lifesaver for heavy animals, particularly when you're dealing with one person potentially doing the majority, or even two, majority of the manipulation. Neurology sends us a lot of these over 40 kilogram dogs that can't walk because the owners can't deal with them at home. And this thing is a lifesaver. But you can do it with people, too. You just have to have two to three people, OK? Um, the nice thing about this hoist is it has adjustable leg width, which you'll see when we, we run a video. It has a two-point balancing hoist, which is good um, for making sure that they don't tip one way or the other. It's battery powered to lift them up and put them down gently. It works to an incredible load of 130 kilograms. We're going to lift a goat next week on this. Um, and the lifting range goes from 42 to 160 centimeters in terms of up and down. Like I said, though, the cost is somewhat substantial, but of all the equipment, I love this thing. I seriously love this. It's a, it's a great device. I would do some modifications to it, but here it is. We're able to walk dogs that are very large relatively um, easily, okay? And here's Barry, and we're on one week now, and you can see he's ambulating much better. He would not be able to ambulate without the sling, however, okay? Let me see, here he goes, and he's just walking around. You can see that he still has significant proprioceptive deficits there. And his gait is somewhat asynchronous, okay? And he crosses over as he turns. Here we are at two weeks. This is another little device I want you to think about. These are wonderful, okay? Any big dog, down dog, immediately one of these slings goes on them. These are called help them up harnesses. They're wonderful. Again, they turn them into a piece of dog luggage, okay? A little dog suitcase. Um, they're wonderful, though, because of how they balance the animal and provide easy lift part, okay? You can see that he's getting better, though, okay? 
One week ago, we couldn't have done this. And you can see that the person in green really is only holding on with one finger there, okay? We're having to carry more of the weight in the rear. So this harness is called Help Em Up, okay? There are a lot of different harnesses out here. This happens to be one of my favorite. I don't receive money for this endorsement. I just like them. Okay, and again, it has the two handles, and you can use these separately, but the most of the cases, when we put this on a dog, they need both of them, okay? Um, it's a complete support and lifting harness. It has extended wear qualities, meaning that it's very comfortable, okay? It breathes well, it doesn't rub generally, although once you put these on the dogs, I suggest you do take them off frequently, at least once a day, and check, okay? Um, it, it's, uh, oh, I spelled that wrong, sorry. Comes in three sizes, medium, large, and extra large, and so it spans a weight of 13 to 45 kgs, and it's a neoprene construct, so we can put them in the underwater treadmill in these, and we can wash them. Per sling, they're about 100 to 120 dollars, U.S. dollars. Here we are at three weeks. Here's his guide dog apparatus. He's acting more like a guide dog now. This with my technician. Okay, and you can see that he's doing very well. A lot of this is just the tincture of time, but again, with this particular owner, even though he was carrying the dog around, he wasn't able necessarily to do what needed to be done to facilitate his recovery. Okay, happy, happy. All right. Let's talk about another case. This is Baxter, okay? Baxter actually with an acupuncture needle in his head. Baxter is a five-year-old um, neutered uh, male castrated. I, did, I fiddled with these slides last night, so I must have been tired. Uh, Laboratory retriever. He presented to the triage, our emergency service, in January for an evaluation of acute onset paraplegia. On physical exam, he's also a big dog, okay? Um, the exam was normal, except for he's non-ambulatory, okay? And they didn't actually palpate any pain on him. Once neurology got a hold of him, they found his mentation to be normal. His gait and posture, he was paraplegic, meaning he had no motor. He actually exhibited shift Sherrington posture, which is a classic anatomic locator sign, meaning nothing else, just location of where the disease is with extensor rigidity in the fore and kind of flaccid um, uh, paralysis in the rear. On palpation, they did find pain on this guy. They're very good at finding pain. And they found it at T10, T12. Postural reactions were normal in the fore and absent in the hind. Um, spinal reflexes were intact. Cranial nerves were normal. Motor was absent in the rear. And he had um, absent sensation in the left hind um, at certain portions of the, the limb. So on neuro evaluation, they located it to T3, L3, okay? Again, that's compatible with the shift Sherrington diagnosis. And on MRI, they found an intervertebral disc herniation at T12, T13 with moderate spinal cord compression, okay? An associated hemorrhage uh, extending from TL to L, T11 to L2 and also multi multifocal intervertebral disc degeneration, but it wasn't necessarily uh, compressive elsewhere. And this is the MRI. In terms of surgery, they did a left-sided hemilaminectomy from TL, T11 to L1 with a prophylactic fenestration from T11-12 to L12, and they referred him to the rehab service. Medication-wise, he came with us on an antidepressant, trazodone, and gabapentin. He was on carprofen and amoxicillin as well. So Bacter's problem list was that he was non-ambulatory paraplegic. Um, he had extensive rigidity, worse in the forelimbs than in the rear, and he had disuse muscle atrophy. So what are we going to do about this? We're going to do some similar things that we did with uh, Barry, assisted standing with hoists and slings and therapy balls and water. Again, this is not rocket science. It's pretty rudimentary stuff. Um, you just need to follow a process. For his extensive rigidity, again, massage and passive range of motion. And disuse atrophy, the therapeutic exercise and gait retraining. OK. This is day one, maybe. 
Oh, you're not gonna show me day one? Here we go. All right, this is day one, and this is actually using water rather than a ball for assisted standing. And you can also see that he has some slings, okay? He's not buoyant enough, even though he is a little bit of a pudgy, pudgy guy, to, to float in water. We probably would also need to get the water up a little bit higher, okay? All right, and so basically the therapist is using the slings plus the water to get him up and standing because he wasn't standing before, okay? Was there a question? No? Are you still alive? Okay. All right. Here is some gait retraining on Baxter. And again, this is actually just more placing the limbs in normal um, positioning. You can see that there's still proprioceptive deficits. Anytime that the therapist notes this, she goes ahead and replaces the, the feet in normal standing position. She's also going to do some weight shifting activity within the water. Here you're going to see in a moment and just basically pushing the dog off the center of gravity and then back on, okay, and loading the legs, okay, back and forth. Easy stuff. So he doesn't have a lot of motor. That's why we're not using the treadmill just yet, okay, because he wouldn't have much to do. Okay, here we are on day three, and we're seeing some progress, huh? Not a whole heck of a lot, but I'm pretty happy with this. You see how that right forelimb is moving just a little bit? Okay, not much in the left, but a little bit of quadriceps contracture here, trying to move that leg forward, okay? Very interesting stuff. Okay, At this point, owners took him home, which was a little bit early for me, but they really wanted to get Baxter home. So we gave him a very simple at-home plan. There's not much here, but it helps the owner interact with the dog. And what our, Baxter's plan was assisted standing for three to five minutes, three times a day, okay? And so that's basically like you saw in the other videos of the dachshunds, getting him up in a standing position, placing the feet in normal standing position, um, and letting them sink down back to sitting. Um, and then the sit to stand exercises again twice a day uh, for 15 repetitions. This is week four. We worked with Baxter a really long time. Okay, it's not normal, but my goodness, he's ambulatory, right? He's still ataxic in the rear, and he's still a little hypermetric too, okay? Still food oriented, but you notice that he's maybe a little thinner. They've cut down on his diet. Okay. This is one of our lamb treadmills. You've seen a different type. This is a human lamb treadmill um, used in uh, rehabilitation centers. Human treadmills work really well. However, their um, belt length is anywhere from five feet to six feet. And once you get much bigger than, than this size dog, Dogs have a tendency to fall off. So the canine ones are very nice because those are seven feet. I don't know what that changes to meters in length, but they're bigger. And so they can accommodate uh, large breed dogs better. Okay, this is six months. Baxter really likes us. Baxter comes in about um, every now two weeks, uh, mostly because he loves the, our technician, Joanne. And you can see that he's still hypermetric, a little ataxic in the rear, but strongly ambulatory. Now, he could go on and improve, but my guess is this is, this is what we're going to get with this dog, okay, at this point. But he's very functional, and he's a great pet, okay? Owners are very happy with their outcome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? All right. Thank you. Lunchtime. Vamos agora interromper para o almoço. Uh, vamos reiniciar às duas e meia. Natasha Olby com o tema na approach to altered meditation. Meditation. Portanto, peço desculpa e aproveitem então o resto da tarde. Obrigado. Hope you're all ready for a nice nap now.
We're going to talk about change mental status, and one change is to go to sleep. My, my favorite change, actually. So kind of as we get started, I've got a slightly different picture of the vet school here. This is the front of the old vet school in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the reason I took the picture is the tree. So one of the things that amazed and pleased me the most about North Carolina is the springtime. In spring, like every single plant on the ground seems to have flowers. It is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And these are redbud trees. These are amazing to me because the flowers just come straight out of the branches. They just stick out everywhere. Oh, it's lovely. Anyway, so if you're going to come to North Carolina, come in the spring. That's what I say. Autumn's good as well. Summer is beastly hot, I think. OK, we're going to talk about changes in mental status. And they're very common. The question is, as I say here, what is normal? So you see this dog here eating spaghetti. And I would say that is quite normal. Dogs like to eat spaghetti. The thing that's strange to me is if that was one of my dogs, there's no way the spaghetti would be there long enough for you to take a picture. I mean, that spaghetti would be down. So you've got to talk to owners about what is normal and what isn't. So what do we mean when we say mental status? And this is quite important to me. I get quite pedantic about this, actually. Because to me, this term really covers two very different aspects. And they're different because they cover different parts of the brain. And localization is everything to a neurologist, OK? So to me, mental status is a combination of the level of consciousness or wakefulness, OK, and behavior. Behavior is quite different to level of consciousness. Now, I've got this. Can you read this from back there? I love this. Yeah, this is behavior, OK? So here's Pavlov with his dogs, thinking that he's trained his dogs to uh, salivate by ringing a bell. Um, Whereas the dogs think they've got it the exact other way around. Watch what I can make Pavlov do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. I love that. OK, so let's talk about level of consciousness first. This is controlled by the ascending reticular activating system, okay? which is a great big mass of neurons of gray matter throughout the brain stem, throughout this part here, that projects on up through the thalamus onto the cortex, OK? But really, the cell bodies that are important are here in the brainstem, OK? So we define different levels of wakefulness. There are a lot of different terms used. We have animals that could be depressed. Some people use the word obtunded, OK? For this, they're just less responsive than you would normally expect. And I can tell you that if you don't know the patient, the cat or the dog, or the elephant, or whatever species it might be, it's hard for you to really tell that. That's something you have to talk to the owner about. I would also say that it's very nonspecific. You can be depressed because you're having a bad hair day. I might be a little quiet then. You could be depressed because you've got a low PCV, so you've had uh, an intra-abdominal bleed, for example, or because you've got neurologic disease. OK, so it's very nonspecific. Everybody with me? I ask because when I say bad hair day, none of the girls seem to understand what I was talking about. So maybe you don't have bad hair days in Portugal, but you do in England and you do in America as well. It's very depressing. OK, stuporous means really that these animals are asleep, but you can rouse them. You can rouse them with a strong stimulus. OK? Comatose, they're unconscious, but now you can't rouse them. So what do you think the category is that's below this? Dead. That's right, dead. Something's beeping, but I don't think it's me. OK, so here we've got an example. Here's a little chihuahua. Is it alive? It's blinking an eye. So what would you classify this as? Stuporous, yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, you don't have to use that strong a stimulus to wake it up. Could say it's very obtundant, but no, I think stuporous is reasonable. It looks like it went out and drank eight pints of beer the night before. It's got a bad headache. Doesn't want to be there. OK, now let's talk about behavior, the other portion of mental status. This is controlled by the forebrain, telencephalon and diencephalon. 
It's really a product of processing of sensory information and memory. That's a real, real simplification, but I think it's a useful working way of thinking about it. So the reason that you're able to listen to me and react and behave is because of all the sensory information coming in that you're processing and putting together, OK? And then you have learned behavior because of memory. So forebrain, we don't need to go through all this. There's a whole load of cortex. Different parts of the cortex control different parts, OK? We won't go down deeper into the limbic system and things. I will spare you that. But I think one of the important things to remember is that your cortex is processing information from the contralateral side of the body, OK? Brainstem spinal cord, all the same side. Forebrain, contralateral side. There's a crossover, OK? All right, so definitions. We use a lot of different words. They've really not been standardized. So something that is behaving weirdly, I use the term inappropriate a lot because that's a very useful catch-all term. If an animal is responding in an inappropriate fashion, it's inappropriate. You could use the term encephalopathic. You could say demented. If they're having real bouts of frenzy, you could say hysteria. And we also have this very specific kind of term slash localization of hemi and inattention. So have a look at this dog. So first thing to say is, as you look at this little dog, you can see it's got quite a big head, yeah? Well, so next door to our vet school, there's a fairground. You all know what a fairground is? Well, I mean, in this case, it's a public area. And at the weekend, there's a flea market. In other words, people can bring things, set up a stall, and sell things. OK? I love going there. You can find all kinds of crazy things, also all kinds of crazy people. Uh, when I first moved to Raleigh, they also sold puppies. There was a puppy area. They don't do that anymore. That kind of makes me sad. But they used to sell puppies. And this is a flea market puppy. The lovely young girl who bought this puppy bought it because it had such a cute, big head. Bad decision, OK, bad decision. But anyway, she lived with this dog for years. So if you look at this dog, it's walking in circles, always to the left. It can walk pretty well. It's strong, always going to the left. It's exploring the environment. So that behavior is appropriate, but it's always to the left. Now it's looking. It's looking to the left. Everything to the left, OK? Now we're going to do its postural reactions. So here we are on the right. Hmm. OK, can place its foot. It's kind of slow, though, isn't it? And remember, it was walking around pretty well. And just look at how it's reacting to having this done. It's not very interested, OK? And this is a naughty little puppy. This is a terrier, you know? <coughs> now we go to the left side and look at the different response. So doesn't even allow her to pick up the foot. And in fact, it's going to try to bite her. See the difference in awareness of the two sides? So this is an example of hemi inattention. OK? Here's an animal who has a left forebrain lesion. It's unaware of the right side of its body, the sensory information, or it's got reduced awareness. But its muscle strength is still good. It can still walk around. It's walking to the left because that's the world it can see and appreciate. It can't appreciate the world on the other side because it's just not getting that information. OK? Because the left side of its brain is not processing information from the right side. So that's a hemi inattention syndrome. It's quite common. All right. What are the causes of changed mental status? Well, any disease that affects forebrain or brainstem. OK? But just a note again, a sick animal can be depressed. It doesn't necessarily mean it's got disease of the nervous system. OK? So how do we approach them? Well, the usual thing, you take an accurate history. But the important things for this is really what's normal for this pet. You have to talk to the owner. You have to listen to the owner. So any evidence of pain, because that can really change its behavior. OK? Physical and neuro exam, of course. Hopefully localize the problem and identify any other physical problems. And then often we're trying to rule out a metabolic or systemic problem, like low blood glucose, like liver disease, things like that. Always do a blood pressure and always look in the eyes, any neuro patient. Okay? 
And then blood work, if we're thinking maybe metabolic, a bile acid tolerance, then we go to brain imaging and CSF analysis. So pretty straightforward routine approach to these cases. So let's talk about some cases. Okay, this is the chihuahua I just showed you. It's a four-year-old male castrated chihuahua attacked by a German shepherd dog. And in the attack, it got thrown against a wall and it fractured its tibia and fibula. It went to a local specialist, a surgeon, who surgically repaired that tibia and fibula, no problem at all. And two days later, the dog started to act rather strangely. Okay? Of course, what I failed to mention is this dog was owned by a local human neurosurgeon, and even more, it was actually owned by his three-year-old daughter. Okay? A lot of emotion here. All right? But when this surgeon started to say it was showing neurologic signs, we believed him because he knew what he was talking about. So this rapidly progressed to tetraparesis, central blindness, and the obtundation, and actually even progressed to stupor, as you saw. So again, if we look at that video, we have a little dog here who is tetraparetic. I guess it wasn't a tibia and fibula, was it? It was a radial ulna. Got my legs muddled up. I'm sure if I hadn't said anything, you wouldn't have noticed that, would you? He has a large tongue, but we know that's normal for chihuahuas. We worry because he's a chihuahua. We worry about congenital an anomalies. Um, but we have a dog when we do the neuro exam where we have quite diffuse neurologic signs. So what would you do? Of course, we're going to do some blood work. Interestingly, he hadn't had blood work done before he had his surgery. They just did what we call a big four, a packed cell volume, a blood urea nitrogen, a glucose, and a total solid. So that's all that had been done. So we're going to do blood work, look at his urine, do blood pressure and do a funding exam. That's just our basic routine stuff. Okay, here's the blood work. So I'll give you a minute to look at this and just while you do, I'll just talk a little bit about my thought process with this case. So I saw a case that definitely had signs of brain disease, seemed to have been brought on by this trauma, but was also tetraparetic, so I was worried about his spinal cord. Chihuahuas, AA luxations, yeah? had a trauma, so I was worried we needed to rule out an AA luxation. But then I was also worried maybe the dog had a hydrocephalus, maybe his deterioration had nothing to do with the trauma because it happened two days later, maybe he has encephalitis now. We see a lot of encephalitis cases. But here's the blood work, and if I highlight things, because I'm sure everything looks a little bit different, here we've got the albumin, which is low, yeah? We've got BUN, oh, look at that, it's low. Cholesterol, hmm, also low, a lot of low things here. Globulins, a little bit low too. Glucose was fine, glucose was on the high side. So, can you diagnose this dog? You can make a diagnosis now. Anybody got it? Aren't many diseases where you have lows? Okay, we'll give you some more results. We're going to do some bile acid tests. Now, at this point, this dog is kind of stuporous, so we can't really give it food. So we just did a resting bile acid. Now, I know that um, units can be different. So a normal would be up to about 20. So we've got very, very high bile acids. OK, do we have a diagnosis now? Put a systemic shunt. Yes. Ammonia, really, really high. Abdominal ultrasound, a single portoazagous shunt. Cervical radiographs we did because the dog had had trauma. There was no problem. We ultrasounded the brain as well to have a quick little peek through and just check there was nothing else going on there. But actually this dog had, his only problem was the portosystemic shunt. Responded really well to rectal lactulose and a diet change. As soon as we went on to oral medications with antibiotics and lactulose, the signs came back. And actually that video is when the signs came back. So we actually had the shunt corrected surgically and did extremely well, thank goodness. Okay. All right, here's another one. This is a good one, and I wish I had the sound effects for this one, but unfortunately, I cut them out ages ago, and I shouldn't have done. This is an eight-year-old female spade shih tzu. Has episodes of abnormal behavior, okay? And you could trigger this behavior by touching his tail. This is a neurologist called John Meeks, who was quite a character and quite enjoyed this dog. You can see we're a little afraid of this dog. A little afraid. Now, the sound effects like rah, 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 going like that. Ooh, and then he's dizzy. 
<laughs> Always went in that direction. But when we did a neuro exam, the dog was totally normal. No asymmetry, unlike the little terrier I showed you. No asymmetry, totally normal neuro exam. Okay? So this we'd say is an abnormal behavior. So does the dog have a neurological problem? Do you think it's normal to chase your tail? Oh, not really. He does have a neurological problem, but perhaps not in the sense of, does he have a brain tumor? No, probably not. So where would you localize the problem given the neuro exam's normal? Neuro exam being normal tells you it's not a focal problem. Okay. What would you do? What would you all do? I would send this to a behaviorist. I don't need to see this dog again. We can image his brain, it's going to be normal, because his neuro exam was normal. We can trigger this behavior. When we spent some time talking with the owners, they'd recently moved house, they had a lot of stress going on. When the owners weren't there, it didn't do it anywhere near as much as when they were there. Okay, so we had a very typical set of signs suggesting this was a behavioral problem. But one of the most important things is that you do your neuro exam and you don't find any focal abnormalities. Okay? So, stereotypical behaviors are triggered by certain events, can be interrupted usually, usually. Normal neuro exam, normal blood work, and if you image their brain and stuff, it would be normal. Okay? So this dog needs some therapy, but not from us. All right? Everybody okay with that? Okay, here we've got another one with episodes of strange behavior. A five-year-old male castrated rough-coated collie. So these behaviors would last for about 45 minutes, sometimes even as long as four hours. Okay? Every time they happen, the dog would do the exact same thing, and they're a bit more complex than that tail chasing. Here they are. I'm sorry, this is a really old video that came from the owner. And I love that the owners had their like 10-year-old son holding the biting dog. So do this, do the chomp, 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 and then pace off in spite of being held. Off he goes, then he loses all muscle strength and falls down, then pops up again. And that goes on and on and on, 45 minutes up to four hours. Okay, what do you all think of that? I can tell you the neuro exam was totally normal. Totally normal, physical exam, totally normal. So does this dog have the same problem as the last dog we talked about, a behavioral problem? No, oh, probably not. Why do we say no? Hmm. What do you think's happening? This dog's actually in status epilepticus. So this dog's having seizures, they're partial seizures, okay? Um, we define status epilepticus as anything that's over five minutes. That's clearly over five minutes. It's in partial status epilepticus. And it's far more common for us to see these partial status epilepticus dogs go for a long time because people simply don't recognize their seizures. They don't recognize it because the dog's walking around, almost appears like it comes back to them, but it, it doesn't really. It's not responsive to them. They can't interrupt the behavior. It'll keep on going on, keep on going on. So the appropriate workup, of course, is blood work, bile acid tolerance, blood pressure, fundic exam, and then, if we can, we love to do advanced imaging of the brain, CSF analysis, and we could do an EEG to try and confirm that this was a seizure. Our problem would be that we'd have to get the EEG when he was having one of these seizures, which can be really tricky to orchestrate, okay? If you couldn't do all that workup, this is a young collie. What do you know about collies? Anybody know anything about collies? Are they a popular breed here? Now, yeah. they get terrible idiopathic, in other words, inherited epilepsy. This is the right breed, the right age, his neuro exam's normal. He's probably an idiopathic epileptic. So if the owner said, no, I can't do that workup, that's fine. Do the blood work, start treating the seizures, okay? In this particular dog, we do have an EEG showing very clearly a lot of seizure activity during the seizure. Okay. So seizures are not usually triggered by anything in particular. Unlike humans, where there are a lot of known triggers, that's pretty unusual in dogs and in cats. There are some cases that could be triggered by sounds um, or particular lights and things like that, but it's very unusual. You can't interrupt them unless you use an appropriate drug. 
can see these ectonic seizures. They're not unusual in collies, in Labrador retrievers, where they just lose all muscle tone and hit the floor. Okay? That's actually quite common. And one tip I have is if you're thinking some weird episode might be a seizure, if you think of the representation of the dog's body on the cortex, the most important parts for fine movements are lips, tongue, nose, things like that. They don't play the piano. They don't have five fine movements. At least the dogs I know don't usually play the piano. Um, don't have fine movements, uh, fine digital control. What this means is if you have a larger area of the cortex dedicated to the face, you're more likely to see the face involved in a seizure. So for weird events, if you ask the owner to look, are they clenching their jaw, are they licking, are they smacking their lips, are they swallowing? Um, often you'll find that they are, and that can be a nice clue into them being a seizure. Nowadays, because everybody's got their smartphone, they can actually take videos for you. So it's kind of revolutionized neurology for us, it really has. An EEG is great, but it's just you have to get them during a seizure, so that's harder. All right, how are we doing? Doing well. All right, so this is an onset of, of behavior. 12-year-old male castrated Persian cat. Okay, so an old cat. Over three weeks, it's lost its appetite. It has had a generalized seizure. And now the owner says it just won't settle down. It's pacing, 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 pacing. Won't settle down. So odd behavior for this cat. So here's the cat. So odd right away because it's allowing us to videotape it walking, unusual for a cat. So we're walking in circles to the right. Oh, we went to the left. Uh, which way are we going to go? We're a bit confused, a bit confused. Are we going to go left? Yeah, we can go left, OK. Still a bit confused, starts to meow a little. OK, now we're going back to the right. You see, he's just a bit confused, really, isn't he? Or kitty cat. Now, we do have video of his postural reactions, but they're a little bit hard to make out because he's so hairy. And he's actually got good proprioceptive placing or conscious proprioception. When we ask him to hop, he doesn't do quite such a good job. This is Dr. Manana, Karen Manana, one of my colleagues at NC State. I think we're going to get a hop now. Yeah, here we are. It's a hop to the right. Ooh, pretty poor hop to the left. Yeah? So, we have a cat that will circle in both directions, but does tend to go more to the right. Certainly appears a bit confused and disorientated. Has poor postural reactions on the left. So it localizes to its forebrain. It had a seizure as well that tells us forebrain. Right more than left. OK? So of course, in an older cat, we need to image its brain. How about we just run straight to that? And here's what we found in its brain. A lesion that's in the midline, but off more to one side than the other. Hence the will go both ways, but more one way than the other. This is a meningioma. We know that. We don't really know it till we get the histopathology, but really we know that. It's got a really broad, broad base and a dural tail sign. It's pushing the brain down in. But more importantly, the bone overlying it, remember on MRI, bone looks hypo-intense, looks black. Look at how sclerotic this bone is. And that classically occurs over a meningioma. So we want to take that out, OK? And so we did, <laughs> and the cat did extremely well. This is what they look like afterwards, the Franken, Franken cat, I guess. Um, but they, they really do extremely well. So just a few words of warning with cats. So cats, I kid you not, that mass was enormous, wasn't it? And really, the cat didn't come, become all that clinical neurologically till it had the seizure. Prior to that, it went off its food. 
It's very common that these guys will actually go in and out of the medicine service for quite a long time before we see them because the only signs they show are like loss of appetite. They don't show overt neurologic signs until they get to a crisis point, okay? And the decompensation when it happens can be a disaster because they herniate, okay? And we like to get them before that because if they've got a meningioma, we can more or less cure them in a, at least 50% of the cases. So indicators that you might have that going on. Sometimes the owner will say, oh, he had nystagmus. Well, they say his eyes were um, flipping around, okay? Sometimes they'll do some weird yowling, and sometimes they'll have episodes of transient weakness, which quite often they go to the vet, they get a shot of steroids, and they're normal again. That's because you treated the edema around the tumor. Okay, so those are the warning signs, and I, I really hate it when we don't get those cats in time because I know we can make a difference to them. Okay, now we're going to go to cute little puppy. 16-week-old male, intact, Maltese puppy presented for lethargy, anorexia, and circling. And here is this puppy. It is the cutest dog in the world. And it's doing what the owners have reported. So see how it looks like it's falling asleep? It's dozing off. Oh, and then it catches itself, and up it goes. Walk around a little bit. That looks pretty normal. It's investigating something on the mat, that's pretty normal behavior. We haven't seen any circling, it's stopped again now. You see there's a whole crowd watching this little dog. Now it appears to be falling asleep again. It's wobbling a little bit. Oh, and now we're awake again. Neuro exam was otherwise normal, okay? But we're getting all excited about what could be going on with this dog, all right? Does it have narcolepsy? Does it... Although the owners hadn't actually reported it falling asleep at home. They just said they thought it was more lethargic, it hadn't been eating well, and it was circling. It wasn't circling in only one direction, it could be either direction. So this dog appears to fall asleep whenever it stands still and looks kind of druggy, Yeah? So our proposed workup for the owners is a young puppy. Let's do blood work. Let's do a bile acid tolerance test and an ammonia. Maybe it's got a shunt. Let's do a quick little ultrasound of the brain. We can see in with the ultrasound. That's inexpensive. If it's got bad hydrocephalus, we might see it just with the ultrasound. So that was our kind of initial approach. However, we then got a little bit more history. The owners offered this up, okay? They gave acepromazine to it before they traveled to us. So now we have an excellent, excellent explanation of why this dog looked like it was falling asleep. It was falling asleep. It had been sedated, okay? Dog was normal the next day. We hospitalized it and kept it for the next day. Obviously, we weren't as interested. The dog was totally normal the next day. Um, we certainly did the proposed blood work because it had come to us with a complaint of lethargy, anorexia, and circling. We just didn't see that once the acepromazine had, had worn off. And everything was normal, and the dog went home and ate fine and was absolutely fine. Moral of this story, my experience, if they look drugged, they usually are. Okay? And we have had plenty of dogs that have come in and taken some illicit substance, the owner's little stash that they don't want to tell you about. Okay? So with those cases, my approach is, ooh, they've got diffuse signs. Let's wait, let's watch. If it did get into something, it'll probably look a bit better the next day. Probably will. Sometimes the owners will admit to it. I once had a father and mother bring a very, very hysterical, crazy dog in. And as soon as the mother left the room, the son said, I know what's wrong. He ate my stash. Okay. All right, well, we'll watch him and see what he's like tomorrow. Okay, so last little bit I want to talk about is when we have to treat changes in mental status as an emergency, all right? So to me, any animal that is stuporous or comatose is an emergency. Any spinal animal that can't walk is an emergency. Any brain animal that's stuporous or comatose is an emergency. So we already said the level of consciousness or wakefulness is controlled by the ascending reticulate activating system in the brain stem, all right? So if you have coma, 
it's most commonly due to severe brain stem disease. Okay. And certainly it could indicate dangerously high intracranial pressure. So let's talk about that a minute. All right, what do we mean about that? So intracranial pressure. So your brain is protected by being in a bony box, the skull, which is great. Okay? Your skull contains your brain, CSF and blood, basically. Increase in volume in any of those can cause an increase in intracranial pressure. Okay? Why is that a problem? Two reasons, all right? The first is, I think I might have these written here. The perfusion of the brain is dependent on how the pressure for forcing blood into your brain opposed by your intracranial pressure pushing blood out. So as your intracranial pressure goes up, the perfusion of your brain goes down. So that's the first problem. You need your brain to be perfused. Okay? So what happens is you start to increase your intracranial pressure. At first, there's some compensation. CSF will be shunted out. CSF production slows down. And then blood flow slows down. So, if you increase your ICP, ultimately your perfusion pressure decreases. But then the second complication is because it's a physical box, where does the brain go if it gets bigger? The only way it can, it starts to herniate. And that's a big problem. Okay? So, two main types of herniation, forget this one, that we worry about. The first is transtentorial. So, this is where your cortex herniates under the tentorium down into the caudal fossa, compressing your midbrain, okay? And then transforma magnum, where your cerebellum herniates out of the forma magnum, compressing your medulla. Two different parts of the brain, all right? We're doing a study right now, reviewing how many of our dogs on MRI, dogs and cats, have herniation of which area. It's quite interesting. So how do we recognize herniation and how do we grade it? So in order to do that, you have to understand brainstem function. So what do we have in the brainstem? We have the motor tract starting in the brainstem, the important ones for our patients, and the sensory tracts all go on through. Okay? We have cranial nerve nuclei from cranial nerve 3, the ocular motor, to 12, the hypoglossal. So the vast majority of our cranial nerves. We have consciousness, or the ascending reticular activating system, and then we have the things that keep you alive, respiration, cardiovascular system. Okay? So what happens with dysfunction? Well, because of those long motor and sensory tracts, the first things you see are tetraparesis and abnormalities in hopping and conscious proprioception. You will also see deficits in cranial nerves. And it's going to depend where the lesion is exactly as to what you see, but one of the most common things we see are central vestibular signs. When things get really severe, we see abnormal pupillary light reflexes. More about that in a minute. As things get more severe, so we've got weakness in cranial nerve deficits, then we start to see a change in consciousness. As the consciousness goes down, we then start to see really significant problems, abnormal respiratory rate and rhythm, heart rate, rhythm, and blood pressure. So now we see the things. Your brainstem keeps you awake and alive. As your lesions happen, you lose consciousness, and then you lose the ability to stay alive because you lose, lose the respiratory drive, etc. So what do we see with herniation? Just remember what the brainstem does, okay? If you have transtentorial, it compresses the midbrain right here. So you'll see tetraparesis, motor tracts start right there. You'll see animals go from stupor to coma. And then you see changes in the pupils. You see meiosis, the pupils get small. And then medriasis, they get large and fixed because of abnormalities in the ocular motor nerve, okay, which comes off right here. You also see a ventilation pattern that's quite specific. They hyperventilate. Okay? And then you can also see decerebrate rigidity. All right? So, if you don't do anything about that, they die. If you recognize it kind of somewhere in here, and you treat appropriately to reduce intracranial pressure, you can absolutely save them. Okay? Then we have forma magnum compression, compressing the medulla. So again, you see tetraparesis, you're quite likely to see central vestibular signs, because your vestibular nuclei is sitting back here. Change in mental status, stupor than coma, and you see a respiratory pattern that's a bit different. It's just ataxic. They take a few breaths, and then they stop. And then they breathe a bit more, and then they stop. We don't like to see that at all. 
and then abnormal heart rate, blood pressure, and then, of course, death. Intervening with these guys is harder. Often their outcome is pretty terrible. Not always, though. So for me, when I assess these patients, I look at several different categories of things, and I try and simplify it as I try to simplify most things. I look at motor function. So for most of these animals, when we're getting worried, they've got no motor function. They're comatose, OK? I certainly look for posturing as well. I look at brainstem reflexes. I look at the palpebral, the blink. I look at the dazzle, where you shine a bright light in their eye, and they have a midbrain reflex, which makes them blink and pull the eye back, OK? We look at physiologic nystagmus. As you move their head, can they move their eyes? And we look at the pupillary light reflex, OK? These all go at different times. This is really one of the last to go, OK? Um, the dazzle also is one that goes really late. So you can grade the severity of the coma by looking at these reflexes, and you can monitor it for a change. Of course, we look at level of consciousness, and we look at their vital statistics. Any comatose animal has an EKG on and regular respiratory checks, OK, and blood pressure management. So then I categorize them. And category one, for me, means you need to do something immediately to reduce intracranial pressure. So they're comatose. They've got fixed dilated pupils abnormal respiratory pattern, abnormal blood pressure heart rate. You need to do something straight away, OK? That's pretty easy. Make sure that they haven't just been resuscitated and given atropine, because that will give them fixed dilated pupils, yeah? So be very aware of what drugs they've had. To category two, these guys need a diagnostic workup straight away. They may not need immediate treatment of their intracranial pressure. They're comatose, but responsive pupils, or normal palpebral, normal vital statistics. So they're very stable, they're just asleep, OK? So we need to work them up, but we don't necessarily need to give them drugs to reduce intracranial pressure. Category three, monitor them regularly. They're stuporous, and everything else is present and responsive. We want to work them up. We don't have to give them mannitol and things yet, OK? So here's a case to, to, to really kind of go through the different stages. This was a one-year-old cute little pug who presented to the vet initially for head twitching. Three days later, developed cervical pain, they taxed here, and they sent it straight on into us. By the time we saw it, just the journey there, it was tetraparetic, so weak all four legs, centrally blind, and had signs that localized to the right forebrain. OK? Here's the MRI. So. This is a post-contrast coronal image. And you can see there's a lot of patchy enhancement. This dog's got encephalitis. It's got pug dog encephalitis. No big surprise. If you look at this image, you start to get really worried. All right? Here's a normal brain in sagittal section. Here's this pug. Here's a normal cerebellum. Here's this cerebellum. It's being pushed here by a transtentorial herniation, and it's herniated out through the foramen magnum, OK? So we've got herniation at two points, so this is a disaster. And in fact, this dog had acutely changed under anesthesia, so may well have herniated while in the magnet. So here's the pug now. Here's us assessing the pug. It's off all anesthesia now. It's still intubated and getting oxygen. Obviously, it's not menacing. It's comatose. Now here, we're going to turn the lights down and show you a dazzle and a PLR. There, got a dazzle, got a PLR. It's got a tiny bit of a palpebral as well. I think we're going to show that again. There, you see that? Nice PLR. And here, it's got the classic midbrain transtentorial hyperventilation. So clinically, this dog's in a pretty bad state. It's not total disaster yet, but Pretty bad state. So, OK, tetraplegic, comatose, reduced palpebral, dazzle present, PLR present, tachypnic, hyperpnic, tachycardic, normal blood pressure, encephalitis. So what happened? So we gave mannitol, a half a gram per kilogram over 15 minutes. We also gave a bit of frusamide, uh, 0.3 mg per kg, to potentiate the effect of mannitol. We started treating the encephalitis really aggressively with steroids and cytosol, OK? Diagnosed from the MRI. We didn't do a CSF tap, because we would have just got cerebellar biopsy, OK? 
Raise the head up a little bit to help reduce intracranial pressure. Monitor continuously. So the dog actually improved. We were able to extubate it. And we maintained it for the next two days. But neurologically, um, although it started to get responsive and move around a little, it was not enough for the owners. And at that point, we drew a line and euthanized it. It's not a very happy story. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this cat because it's also not a very happy story um, because it died while the owners were trying to decide whether to do a workup. So, conclusion, mental status, combination of forebrain and brainstem function, doing different things, level of wakefulness and behavior, okay? Owner really does know what's normal behavior. You need to listen to them. Diagnostic approach is really easy. You rule out systemic diseases and you move on to imaging and CSF analysis. Okay, now we've got a dancing video. <laughs> this is to go with Dr. Dunning's dancing video, but this is my daughter at one year of age and we just gave her this plastic phone. And as it turns out, there's a button on this phone that plays music. And when she finds that button, it takes her a little bit of pushing. She dances. But her dancing, there's her dancing. It's nowhere near as sophisticated as Dr. Dunning's children, so she's going to have to have lessons, learn the octopus dance, the robot dance. But uh, she's not there yet. She's thinking about it. Where is that button? Somewhere, there it is. <laughs> All right, so anybody got any questions about mental status? I see that you're all still awake, so I applaud you for that. Well done. Great, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Seguidamente, vamos ter uh, o contributo da doutora Bárbara Assis com o tema Reabilitação em Pacientes Não Cirúrgicos. A doutora Bárbara é licenciada pelo ICBAS e fez todo o seu trabalho, toda a sua pós-graduação portanto relativa à reabilitação e fisioterapia de cães. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigada, eu. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Gostaria de agradecer o, o, o amável convite para a Associação de Estudantes da, da UPAD por poder estar aqui. Uh, antes de iniciar a minha apresentação, gostava de vos apresentar a VEPRA. A VEPRA é uma associação veterinária e europeia de reabilitação e terapia física. Foi fundada em 2009 com o objetivo de difundir mais facilmente a reabilitação baseada na evidência científica na Europa, para não termos todos que andar a fugir para os Estados Unidos para aprender um bocadinho mais com, com, com segurança. Um, desde 2009 organizamos a nossa primeira conferência em Zagreb, na Croácia, a segunda uh, foi na Polónia, em Varsóvia, e este ano apoiamos a Associação Internacional uh, no seu sétimo simpósio de reabilitação uh, uh, e terapia física e, um, em Viena da Áustria. E para o ano uh, vamos estar em, em Rimini, Itália, dia 31 de maio, onde eu gostaria muito de, de rever alguns de vocês e, e de ouvir falar em português. Um, Deixo-vos o convite e ficam aqui os contactos. Passo então à minha apresentação. Venho falar-vos de reabilitação em animais com lesão do sistema nervoso central, uh, uh, cuja, cuja o tratamento não passa pela, pela cirurgia. Um, estou a falar de meningoencefalites, de vestibulopatias centrais, seringa ou hidromielites, patologias de disco, mielas patias inflamatórias e infecciosas, tromboembolismos fibrocartilagíneos e mielopatia degenerativa. Não é a minha intenção, nem temos tempo uh, uh, para um, passar por todas elas, uh, nem tão pouco entrar na patofisiologia das, das doenças, uh, mas sob o ponto de vista de quem vai fazer um plano de reabilitação, quem vai trabalhar com os animais, uh, uh, é importante referir alguns pormenores. Uh, nas hernias de disco, já foram aqui faladas, gostava de deixar bem claro que o tratamento de eleição é cirúrgico. De qualquer forma, para, para animais uh, uh, com sinais clínicos ligeiros ou em que os donos não podem suportar o custo de uma cirurgia ou, ou em que a anestesia em si é contraindicada porque pode, correr, uh, uh, pode pôr em risco a vida do animal ou mesmo nos animais em que há perda de dor profunda por vários dias está indicado o tratamento conservativo que passa 
pelo repouso em jaula durante quatro semanas, com saídas apenas para, para sessões de reabilitação em necessidades fisiológicas. Um, é muito importante dizer que a grande diferença entre realitar um animal uh, pós-cirúrgico ou um animal não cirúrgico é que, é que nestes há a preservação das facetas articulares e, portanto, temos uma coluna vertebral uh, bem mais estável uh, do que nos pós-cirúrgicos. Uh, de qualquer forma, se, se não houver consciência no tipo de exercícios que se pode fazer, no tipo de manipulação que estes animais uh, precisam de ter, as consequências podem, podem ser severas. Um, nas discospondilites já foram, já foram aqui também uh, faladas, há, há a dor na região vertebral afetada, uh, acontece uh, em cães de graça rande, grande, uh, uh, inteiros, um, mas apenas uh, estima-se que apenas 30% dos animais apresentem sinais sistémicos e febro, que juntamente com o aparecimento tardio dos sinais radiográficos, às vezes tornam este uh, diagnóstico um bocadinho difícil. Um, a reabilitação inicia-se assim que o antibiótico começa a fazer efeito, tendo em conta que há enfraquecimento ósseo das vértebras afetadas. E isto é muito importante também quando se desenha um, um, um plano de, de reabilitação. Uh, no tromboembolismo fibrocartilagíneo, uh, uh, refiro-vos por ser a, a patologia vascular mais comum que afeta o sistema nervoso central, uh, é provocada por um infarto agudo da, da, da espinal medula, por um, por um êmbolo de material fibrocartilagíneo, uh, que afeta de, de uma maneira geral as, as intumescências medulares. Uh, Caracteriza-se pela ausência de dor uh, localizada, por um, por um início agudo, geralmente no seguimento do exercício. Um, e os animais apresentam muitas vezes a simetria dos sinais neurológicos, uh, uh, que cessa a sua evolução passadas as 24 horas. Antigamente o diagnóstico era feito uh, muito pela história e por discussão de partes. Hoje em dia um, é possível ver esse infarto da medula na ressonância magnética. A reabilitação inicia-se imediatamente uh, e, 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 e temos a noção que existe completa estabilidade da coluna vertebral na ausência de outras, de outras lesões. Por último, a mielopatia degenerativa que é uma patologia hereditária associada a, um, a uma mutação de um gene semelhante à, à esclerosa miotrófica lateral nos humanos, um, caracteriza-se por uma ataxia e parésia progressiva nos membros posteriores, que evolui de forma não dolorosa uh, para parésia dos anteriores uh, e paralisia dos membros posteriores, com incontinência fecária, uh, uh, urinária e fecal. A reabilitação é fundamental durante todo o processo, Uh, principalmente pela prescrição de exercícios para casa, uh, numa, numa fase mais inicial, uh, com o objetivo de aumentar uh, a massa muscular e manter a massa muscular e depois numa fase uh, uh, apropriada, uh, saber indicar uh, aos donos uh, os dispositivos apropriados, como botas, slings, uh, uh, e num, numa fase mais tardia, uh, as cadeiras de rodas. Uh, Gostava de partilhar só convosco, não é a minha intenção apresentar aqui casos clínicos, não foi para isso que eu fui convidada. De qualquer forma, deixem-me apresentar-vos o Bel. O Bel esteve comigo durante três anos e é um caso de mielopatia degenerativa. Ele começou as reabilitações comigo, tinha 15 anos e eu superei-lhe as velas quando fez 18 anos. Enquanto médicos veterinários, nós... nós Somos muito habituados a, a focarmos num problema e, e classificar os animais. E, portanto, um animal que tem uma lesão uh, uh, no, no cruzado é um ortopédico. E um animal que tem um, uma hérnia discal é um neurológico. Só que quando, quando, quando nós temos, uh, uh, fazemos tensão de desenvolver um plano de reabilitação, nós temos que abrir completamente este leque. E nós temos que, que avaliar uh, uh, o animal como um todo, com todos os problemas que ele apresenta nesse, nesse momento e que, vai, e que vai ter em casa. Porque o sucesso do tratamento uh, passa por, por desenvolver um plano de reabilitação que tenha em conta o, o animal inteiro. E, portanto, para além do básico, uh, uh, do, do óbvio exame neurológico completo, onde é fundamental saber distinguir a dor profunda de movimentos reflexos. Uh, um, e eu nem vou entrar por aí, uh, uh, é obrigatório ter uma, uma história clínica bem feita, 
exame físico uh, uh, também muito bem feito, porque existem muitas doenças sistémicas uh, com influência neuromuscular, como o hipertiroidismo, o hipotiroidismo, o hiperadenocriticismo, e essas doenças depois influenciam não só uh, uh, a implementação dos exercícios terapêuticos, uh, como também vão influenciar a correta uh, avaliação uh, um, de, do plano terapêutico e da evolução do, do animal, por isso é muito importante. O, o exame ortopédico também é obrigatório, porque um animal que tem uma patologia da anca vai ter mais dificuldades em sentar e levantar, por exemplo, e nós temos alternativas para esse exercício. É obrigatório fazer a perimetria, quer dizer, medir os músculos, saber quanto é que aquele animal, quando chegou, como é que estava. É obrigatório fazer a goniometria, saber quanto é que as articulações de facto estendem. Um, é importante registar todas as alterações, abrasões, uh, escoriações uh, e a simetria nas unhas. Uh, quer dizer, tudo isso é importante ficar escrito. Um, também temos as condicionantes quando o animal uh, depois volta para casa. Temos que saber o animal uh, quando... Uh, quando quando for para casa outra vez, vai ter que lidar com escadas, tem que lidar com o piso escorregadio, tem que fazer curvas apertadas e, portanto, temos que saber muito bem o que é que se passa, qual é o ambiente que o rodeia quando ele for para casa. E o temperamento também é muito importante, porque ninguém imagina um labrador, um típico labrador estérico, a ficar enfiado numa jaula, por exemplo, durante quatro semanas. Né? Nós temos que aproveitar as características do animal e tirar partido delas para o nosso plano de reabilitação. E depois é muito importante trabalhar as expectativas do dono no sentido da realidade uh, uh, e também saber se o dono tem capacidade ou não para adquirir competências que lhe permitam uh, uh, ajudar em casa com, com exercícios terapêuticos ou se pelo contrário é completamente inadequado e, e, e poderá pôr em risco até a, a evolução do animal. Um, reunindo isto todo, uh, uh, temos todos os problemas daquele animal, os problemas verdadeiros e com estes problemas nós podemos basear-nos neles para fazer um plano de reabilitação com objetivos bem definidos, objetivos a curto prazo e objetivos a longo prazo. Para a frente. Hum, portanto, nós podemos classificar por uma questão de facilidade os animais em ambulatórios e não ambulatórios e depois estabelecer um plano com objetivos a curto prazo e um plano com objetivos a longo prazo. E depois, a partir daqui, vai ser sempre um processo dinâmico que vai passar pela reavaliação e pela adaptação do plano. Reavaliação e adaptação do plano. E tudo isto deve ficar documentado e escrito. Gostava só de vos dizer que um plano de reabilitação, normalmente, é composto pelas modalidades terapêuticas e pelos exercícios terapêuticos, sendo que as modalidades terapêuticas é, são a, a, os, os TENS, os aparelhos de, de eletroestimulação, a, transcutânea e, e, e neuromuscular, a, os ultrassons, a crioterapia, o tratamento por calor, a iontoforese, a fonoforese, o laser e por aí fora. E depois há os exercícios terapêuticos e é muito importante termos a noção que as modalidades terapêuticas jamais substituem os exercícios terapêuticos, tem que ser tudo em conjunto. Como protocolo inicial para pacientes não ambulatórios, temos como principais objetivos diminuir a dor, manter o sistema musculoesquelético, isto é, manter as amplitudes articulares, manter a massa muscular, impedir úlceras de pressão e implementar tarefas funcionais. Em animais tetaparésicos, principalmente nos animais grandes, um, geralmente o internamento é a melhor opção. Isto porque na manipulação desses animais uh, são necessárias várias pessoas uh, para o manipular corretamente e muitas vezes são mesmo necessários dispositivos especiais uh, para conseguir um, manipulá-los de forma correta, como é aquele, o caso do wirelift, que é, que, é, que é aquele dispositivo uh, lá ao fundo. Uh, por vezes é preciso o, o recorrer aos selinhos, Uh, um, e quando nós estimamos que, de facto, a recuperação daquele animal vai, vai demorar um bocadinho, uh, devemos providenciar uma cadeira de rodas para, para uso intermitente. Um, de uma maneira uh, geral, eu inicio os protocolos com massagem. Uh, na literatura existem muitas vantagens associadas à massagem. Eu utilizo a massagem muito para o relaxamento do animal, massagem superficial. Ele, ele, é incrível como é que um ou dois minutos uma massagem superficial uh, 
podem uh, uh, influenciar o animal a seguir, a ficar muito mais cooperativo uh, uh, nos exercícios que vamos implementar a seguir. Um, os exercícios passivos de, de, de flexão e extensão uh, são importantíssimos, previrem as, uh, previrem as contraturas da cápsula articular, toda a gente fala dos músculos e dos tendões, mas de facto a cápsula articular uh, um, tem que ser mantida e também uh, sofre muito uh, e é a primeira a sofrer com, com, com a inatividade destas, destas articulações. Estimulam também a circulação sanguínea e linfática, melhoram a produção de líquido um, e difusão de, uh, do fluido sinovial, uh, mas não têm qualquer influ, influência na, na, na manutenção dos músculos, portanto, na atividade muscular. Este tipo de exercício pode ser feito na, na, em decúbito lateral, uh, um só membro, uh, utilizando a bicicleta a seguir, fazer os dois ao mesmo tempo, uh, às vezes uh, eles ficam bastante relaxados com, 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 quando se faz os dois ao mesmo tempo, ou o, os membros anteriores ou só os membros posteriores. Um, é muito é importante termos a noção que uh, quando se faz este tipo de exercícios, que aparentemente são básicos, uh, nós temos que, que ter a perfeita noção qual é a orientação correta, a orientação fisiológica do membro. Uh, muitas vezes as pessoas agarram no, no membro, nos cartos ou nos tarsos e funcionam de tipo joystick, quer dizer, alteram completamente a, a, a orientação do membro e, e por vezes chegam mesmo a, a ter problemas articulares ou a, a surgirem a, a novos problemas. Portanto, num plano de reabilitação a, o objetivo é, é, é mesmo melhorá-los e, portanto, temos que ter muita consciência daquilo que, que é suposto fazer-se. É importante nos animais com lesão de motoneurone superior, em que têm hiperreflexibilidade, às vezes temos que fletir um bocadinho os dedos para conseguir uh, fletir o membro na totalidade. Também é importante, uh, quando trabalhamos com, com esse tipo de animais uh, e pretendemos fazer exercícios de flexão e extensão, uh, uh, não fazer pressão nas, nas almofadas uh, plantares, porque isso vai, vai estimular o reflexo extensor. Um... Uh, a estimulação do reflexo flexor e, e, e o extensor também pode ser feito uh, em decúbito lateral ou uh, recorrendo ao auxílio de, de materiais de suporte de peso, como as bolas, fins e os rolos, selinhos, pode ser feito na cadeira de rodas também. Um, passa por, por aplicar uma pressão uh, ou nos dedos, uh, um, mas é uma leve pressão e muitas vezes os animais têm um reflexo tão fraco que às vezes a, ulti, a única coisa que se vê é um trismo muscular, quer dizer, eles começam a tremer um bocadinho e aí nós devemos parar e fletir o, o, o membro na totalidade para, para o animal. Portanto, não, não, não adianta estar a continuar a pressionar porque às vezes é mesmo uh, o, o limite uh, de flexão uh, do animal. Um, o reflexo extensor. Um, também é muito importante. Nós, neste reflexo extensor, é muito mais fácil também fazer em animais com, com, com lesão de motoneurone superior. Um, nós podemos fazer uh, com ele deitado também uh, uh, ou em estação um, e, e passa por exercer pressão precisamente nas almofadas plantares ou fazer cócegas uh, no meio das superfícies interdigitais, aplicando uma leve pressão aquilo que se nota é que, de facto, o animal dá um coice e é com este tipo de exercícios que nós conseguimos ativar a parte muscular e, portanto, manter a massa muscular. Um, nesta fotografia de baixo está a ser associada uma eletroestimulação a, a neuromuscular e, 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 e está a ser aplicado o reflexo, flexor, o reflexo extensor de outra forma, que é levantar o animal e pousar o membro afetado no chão e tentar sincronizar isso com as contrações do aparelho de, de, de eletroestimulação, no sentido de aumentar a eficiência uh, deste exercício. A estação assistida inicia-se uh, imedi imediatamente uh, nos, nos, nos planos terapêuticos. Uh, é muito importante a correta, o correto posicionamento dos animais em estação, portanto, tentar impedir o knuckling em todas as ocasiões. Um, é, é, reforça os extensores posturais, reeduca os músculos necessários ao equilíbrio e para a proteção. Uh, podemos fazê-lo uh, de várias maneiras, recorrendo uh, à água. Animais que se sentem muito bem uh, dentro da água ficam, ficam mais calmos e com a impulsão da água é muito mais fácil uh, mantê-los de pé. Uh, um, uh, outros uh, uh, passaria pelos slings ou pela cadeira de rodas e, e nos animais tetraparésicos. 
uh, principalmente os do tromboembolismo fibrocartilagíneo nestes animais grandes, é muito importante o termos dispositivos que nos permitam uh, mimetizar as atividades diárias, porque nos tromboembolismos fibrocartilagíneos é muito importante que se estimula a plasticidade neuronal e isso só se consegue fazer pela aplicação uh, de exercícios funcionais, mimetizar as atividades diárias, isto é, uh, um animal está deitado e nós vamos passá-lo de deitado para sentado e da posição de sentado para de pé e quando está de pé podemos uh, utilizar o flexo flexor e o extensor no sentido de simular um padrão de marcha uh, uh, e de facto este tipo de dispositivos é, é, é... são fantásticos, ajudam imenso na, na, na reabilitação destes animais. A instituição do padrão de marcha é muito importante, o padrão de marcha que ainda agora estava, estava a falar, nós, este tipo de animais que estão para parésicos, que de facto não ainda, nós quando começamos a trabalhar um padrão de marcha recorrendo precisamente aos reflexos, ou mesmo na underwater treadmill que um animal que está não ambulatório fora, fora da água, vocês viram isso hoje de manhã, dentro de água começa a manifestar os primeiros movimentos e muitas vezes neste animal, neste, neste tipo de animais, o abanar de cauda quando, quando vê o dono serve como fator prognóstico, porque normalmente o, 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 a função motora nos pélvicos segue-se imediatamente a seguir. Portanto, nós podemos utilizar este abanar de cauda de contentamento como fator prognóstico. Num protocolo inicial de fase aguda para pacientes que estão ambulatórios, ainda que tenham déficits proprioceptivos graves, é muito importante uh, trabalhar com eles no sentido da, da, da própria exceção, da perda da, da, da função em si, uh, é, é fundamental, portanto, isso é muito mais importante do que a perda muscular. Então, os nossos exercícios terapêuticos têm que se direcionar precisamente para, para isso, para, para a função em si. Então, uh, uh, todos os exercícios que vimos até agora podem ser aplicados, uh, tirando partido um bocadinho daquilo que eles apresentam de mobilidade, ou seja, recorrendo aos selinhos, um, obrigá-los a, 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 de facto, ambular, a andar, é importante, a tentar impedir o knuckling em todas as ocasiões e por vezes temos que recorrer a dispositivos como este binco que aqui está, um, no sentido de nos ajudar a posicionar corretamente uh, os membros. Uh, podemos recorrer uh, uh, a estes dispositivos especiais, está ali um dorsiflex da, da, da Terapó. Um, por vezes não há dinheiro para mandar vir, vir estas coisas uh, e, portanto, eu uh, costumo utilizar muitas vezes fita adesiva uh, uh, normal das clínicas portanto, e, e tentar fazer exatamente a mesma coisa que o dorsiflex, uh, ou com fita adesiva ou com kinesiotape, também funciona muito bem. Um, recorrer a botas para prevenir uh, abrasões uh, um, quando eles uh, de facto ainda apresentam aqueles, aqueles déficits proprioceptivos que ainda são graves ou a splints um, que, que de facto nos mantêm o, o membro ah, um, a splints que nos uh, mantêm o correto posicionamento do membro uh, é muito importante o uso de, de peitorais Normalmente os pacientes quando chegam a mim deixam logo de usar a coleira e passam para, para peitoral. Uh, o peitoral é, é, é muito importante não só no suporte de um animal que começa a dar os primeiros passos, que, que já começa a ter uma capacidade ambulatória aceitável, mas também, além disso, são muito importantes para um, reduzir a, a velocidade da marcha. Um, um animal que está a começar a andar outra vez, se o fizermos andar devagar o suficiente, ele vai uh, uh, executar corretamente uh, o, o movimento dos membros uh, e se nós o virmos andar um bocadinho mais depressa, ele vai todo atrapalhar, não vai fazer nada de jeito. E é muito importante a reeducação muscular, saber andar direito. O membro tem que, de facto, voltar a, a, ao seu padrão fisiológico normal. Um, além disso, os peitorais também nos ajudam a, a transferir o peso da frente para trás, e isso é, 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 também é muito vantajoso. Um, os slings uh, continuam a ajudar nesta fase, portanto que eles se desequilibrem, uh, mas que não caiam, que não se magoam. 
Um, eu não falei nos cavaletes. Os cavaletes são muito importantes nesta fase. Um, favorecem, de facto, a, a flexão da anca, do joelho e do, e do tarso e, e podem ser depois uh, associados uh, com a passadeira elétrica, porque a passadeira elétrica favorece a extensão da, da anca e do joelho. Uh, no sentido de estimular a própria sessão, podemos recorrer às wobble boards, não só para uh, uh, os membros anteriores, como também para, para os membros posteriores. E os exercícios de dancing, já numa fase mais posterior, uh, os exercícios de dancing associam um bocadinho a resistência e a força muscular com, com o equilíbrio e a própria seção. Nós podemos fazer o dancing lateral e às vezes não precisamos de, de, de dispositivos tão caros uh, uh, ou, ou, ou de, de, de coisas muito, muito elaboradas. Às vezes um banco do jardim e este, vocês os que são do ICBAS devem, devem conhecer, isto é... Isto é, são os bancos do jardim em frente ao Iquas e, e eu trabalho muitas vezes nestas circunstâncias, quer dizer, sem as fisiobolts, sem, sem as wobblebolts, estão ali, boa. <risos> uh, portanto, uh, eu trabalho muitas vezes nestas circunstâncias, sem, sem os aparelhos, sem as wobblebolts, às vezes uh, uh, os ambientes não são, não são os ideais. Um, portanto, é importante o, o, o dancing lateral e o anterior e posterior, que é o rock and roll, physio ball. Um, nos, nos pacientes que têm lesão uh, uh, dos membros anteriores, quando são pequeninos, podemos fazer... Se isto... Ui, não, para trás. Para trás. Uh -uh. Yeah. Um, quando são pequeninos, isto era um gato monoparésico, Uh, uh, que já está na, na, na fase final de, de reabilitação, quer dizer, ele depois ficou totalmente bem, era o Nikito, uh, mas de facto quando eles são pequenos o suficiente nós podemos mesmo fazer o carrinho de mão e transportá-los uh, uh, de uma forma mais simpática. Uh, para aumentar uh, a força do tronco, dos estabilizadores do tronco, estabilizadores da coluna, nós podemos recorrer a exercícios como a estabilização rítmica em cima das bolas, uh, um, para alguns animais é muito estressante, a primeira vez que estão em cima da bola estão em pânico, agarram-se com as unhas, agarram-se agarram com os membros, mas de facto há alguns que, que apreciam verdadeiramente a viagem e, e, e é muito reconfortante trabalhar com eles a, 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 assim. Um, as underwater treadmills, não vos vou amassar com isso, de facto é um prazer sempre que se tem a hipótese de, de trabalhar com, com este tipo de dispositivos a, a, um bocadinho economicamente distantes da, nossa, da minha realidade, pelo menos, um, e, e ajudam sem dúvida na, na, na reabilitação uh, deste tipo de pacientes uh, neurológicos. Um, como protocolo a médio, longo prazo, uh, temos que ter consciência que a atrofia muscular é quase tão importante como como a função neuromuscular, como a perda de funções neuromusculares, pelo que devemos dar preferência aos exercícios que, que privilegiem o aumento da força, o aumento da resistência. Então tudo aquilo que nós falamos até agora é aplicado, mas temos que dificultar uh, um, esse tipo de exercícios. Então a marcha podemos fazê-la em planos inclinados, podemos fazê-la na passadeira uh, elétrica terrestre inclinando a passadeira, um, Podemos eh, introduzir nesta, nesta altura curvas, eh, círculos, andar em oitos, um, podemos introduzir as, as bandas elásticas para conferir resistência aos dois membros ou um membro específico, um, podemos associar cavaletes com, com as bandas ou trabalhar com as bandas em cima da passadeira elétrica, que é muito mais fácil. Um, o dancing assim tão, tão esticado, é preciso ter muito cuidado quando de facto vamos prescrever um exercício de dancing para um animal. Nós temos que nos assegurar que de facto aquelas articulações das encas, dos joelhos, que dos tarsos, está tudo em ordem, que senão não podemos, não, não podemos promover a, a extensão assim de, desta maneira. Nós, num plano de reabilitação, se magoarmos um animal, se o prejudicarmos, vamos atrasar a sua evolução de, de, de forma considerável. 
Um, depois, num, num protocolo a médio e longo prazo, uh, temos que ter um, uh, muito presente uh, aquilo que o animal vai enfrentar em casa. Nesta fase, os animais muitas vezes já andam com toda a facilidade uh, numa superfície plana, mas o, o subir um degrau ou o subir dois degraus já, já requer... Uh, um, já, já é um exercício com alguma dificuldade para eles e, portanto, às vezes eu vejo no, no, nos livros ou, ou, ah, subir uh, dois ou três degraus, x vezes por dia. E, quando se vai para a prática, depois nós vemos que na realidade, às vezes, um degrau já é um desafio imenso para aquele animal e se aquele animal conseguisse subir esse degrau corretamente, ou seja, com, com os membros bem colocados a fazer um movimento fisiológico, de flexão, quer dizer, sem, sem abduções, sem círculo de abduções, uh, uh, se subir aquele degrau corretamente, uh, uh, se calhar uh, vale mais a pena do que subir três ou quatro ou dois ou três, uh, todo torto. Uh, e, portanto, nós devemos começar pelo, pelo aquilo que, que o animal consegue fazer verdadeiramente e, então, depois aumentar a intensidade e o número de, de, de repetições. Um, o exercício sentar e levantar também é outro dos casos em que, de facto, temos que saber qual é o propósito do exercício. Porque às vezes recebo animais, ah, ele está tá, tá muito bem, ele senta-se uh, quatro ou cinco vezes, uh, três vezes por dia, está muito bem. E de repente olhamos para o animal e o animal está a se levantar com as patas da frente. Ou seja, os animais que têm patologia da enca ou patologia do joelho, muitas vezes, se vocês repararem como é que, como é que eles uh, se levantam, eles estão a, a utilizar os membros da frente e a utilizar toda a musculatura do tronco e, e, e relativamente aos membros posteriores não estão a fazer nenhum, portanto aquele animal até pode fazer 20 repetições, não está a fazer nada aos membros posteriores não é? portanto nós temos que os ensinar verdadeiramente a utilizar os membros posteriores e isso como é que se faz? No exercício de sentar e levantar, os membros da frente ficam quietinhos e são os de trás que se levantam e, e a partir de agora quando, quando olharem para um animal a sentar e levantar já vão ter isso em mente e, e já vão ver que tipo de músculos é que ele está ali a, a utilizar, ou mandar sentar e levantar, ah, olha, vá para casa e faça sentar e levantar não sei quantas vezes. Isso às vezes não, não, não resulta e é por isto que não resulta, está bem? Um, nesta fase... Uh, 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 nesta fase faltam aqui os pinos, uh, uh, provavelmente está no slide a seguir. Um, isto que está aqui a aparecer são as pirâmides de equilíbrio. Isto só se utiliza mesmo já numa fase uh, final de reabilitação, quando queremos, uh, uh, quando o nosso objetivo é a recuperação da função total um, e, e, e requer um, um, uma exigência em termos de, de proporção e de equilíbrio um, já muito elevada. Portanto, uh, uh, já, já é uma situação que de facto. Uh, tenha em vista a recuperação da função total. Um, cá estão os meus pinos, tá? os slides estavam trocados. Um, a passadeira elétrica nesta fase é muito importante para a introdução do trote. Portanto, exercícios de velocidade é muito mais fácil nós trabalharmos numa passadeira elétrica em que podemos alterar a velocidade, fazer variações de velocidade, do que estar a pedir ao dono para ir correr com ele duas e três vezes por dia, porque a maior parte dos donos não, não, não vão. Um, e, de facto, trabalhar com eles assim na passadeira para a introdução do, do, do trote é muito mais fácil. Uh, reparem aqui na, no, nos pinos uh, como, é, como esta coluna um, está dobrada, não é? Quer dizer, este tipo de exercício já está mesmo a trabalhar uh, uh, os cormas, o, o, o tronco, quer dizer, os músculos uh, um, os longuíssimos, os paravertebrais uh, uh, dorsais. Uh, um, e, de facto, já são exercícios para aqueles animais em que a recuperação quer atingir níveis de agility e, e, e por aí fora. Já não é, já não é um animal comum. Um, e depois, a partir desta fase, os animais já estão, muitas vezes, uh, uh, livres de, de limitações. E, e então, se, se eu tivesse uma... uma uma underwater treadmill ou uma underwater treadmill com jatos uh, para, para os poder pôr a nadar lá dentro e, e monitorizar a pressão sanguínea, uh, uh, monitorizar uh, a frequência cardíaca e a frequência respiratória, era o ideal, quer dizer, uh, iríamos então uh, direcionar-nos para esse tipo de, de, de exercícios em que requer mesmo muita força uh, em termos musculares, eles estão a trabalhar de facto a, a parte muscular. Quem não tem as underwater treadmills, a piscina também é uma excelente opção. Quem não tem nenhuma das duas, 
utiliza aquilo que tem e por vezes a natureza vai dando umas ajudinhas e, e põe-nos os animais a, 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 a trabalhar por nós. Uh, e termino assim a minha uh, apresentação. Uma pergunta? Não. Visto que não há perguntas, só me resta agradecer o brilhante contributo que trouxe ao nosso Congresso. Muito obrigado. E convidar então os colegas para mais um intervalo. Com a doutora Diane, que nos vai proferir a palestra intitulada Basic Acupuncture for Neurologic and Orthopedic Cases. Hopefully we're going to give you a little taste of what acupuncture is all about, although honestly most training programs um, that cover this material are at, at least um, you know, a good two weeks, three weeks long. So we're only really going to gloss the surface here and introduce some concepts, some big concepts, and hopefully give you some take-home bits of information to utilize um, on yourselves. Um, and potentially in your practices. So can I ask you who in the audience does acupuncture now? All right, hey you, I recognize you. All right, anybody else? Who has had acupuncture done on them? Okay, I see one, two, three, four, maybe. Okay, who would never have acupuncture done on them? Oh, golly, okay, don't throw anything at me, all right? Okay, so what we're going to do is go over some just definitions and some descriptions because acupuncture sounds crazy and Chinese medicine sounds absolutely just based on a bunch of stuff and nonsense, okay? But it really isn't, all right? Um, but it does have a lot of terminology that, and concepts that are somewhat foreign to us. So just I ask that you keep an open mind here. I'm a huge skeptic, okay? And I think that there's something to this stuff. So just keep an open mind and, and think, try to think about things differently. And the thing that I enjoy most about Chinese medicine and acupuncture is it's given me, fairly late in my career, a new way of looking at things, you know? I've been doing orthopedics for a really long time, so um, I got my boards in, I guess, 1999, right? And so, you know, I've been doing orthopedics, teaching the problem-oriented approach, teaching how you approach orthopedic cases, which is really good, and I firmly believe in it. But I think there's also a merit to looking at things in a different way, and it's sometimes coming up with the same point uh, of a diagnosis, but maybe some different ways of treating things or ancillary or auxiliary things to treat um, conditions. So we're going to go over a brief history just because it's amusing more than anything else, okay? Then we're going to talk about the science from both the Western perspective and the Eastern perspective. I'm going to give you some points that you can use on yourself and your friends at parties, okay? And then we're going to have a case discussion. Okay, so what is acupuncture, okay? Acupuncture is a, an evidence-based system, okay? It's an empirically-based system that looks at energy in a different way, and energy used in the form of healing, okay? It addresses, activates, and complements the self-healing powers of the body. So it really actually, instead of imposing medication or imposing treatments on the body, okay, from external, iatrogenically, um, it uses the body and its own inherent powers um, to heal. Everyone's heard of the concept of benign neglect, right? Right? Sometimes that's the best thing of all, because I know as a surgeon, I can tell you some pretty terrible stories of things that I have done to animals that have ultimately hurt them more than it's helped them, okay? So sometimes doing nothing, the body will return back to normal, okay? Because that's what it wants to do. Stimulation of acupuncture points influences this energy of the body, okay, along particular channels, and they're also called meridians, okay? And the whole point of acupuncture and 
And the concept of disease in Chinese medicine is that it's involving blockages of this particular type of energy, okay? And these blockages accumulate and become stagnation, okay? And that stagnation really doesn't allow the energy to flow, and that's the, the concept of disease, okay? So what does acupuncture have to offer? The first and foremost, the most tried and true things, actually even within the uh, Western literature, is pain reduction. There are some um, great studies out there within the literature of the use of acupuncture for analgesia, anesthesia, and chronic pain reduction. And as you get further along in your career, you'll find that some of the most untreated types of pain and the most difficult types of pain to treat are the chronic cases. We just run out of things to do. You know, we treat them with surgery, we treat them with drugs, maybe we do some acupuncture, hopefully later on, and then we try it and see what happens. But acupuncture and also rehab um, provides us kind of an, another avenue of therapy. Improved organ function, okay? There are Chinese um, therapies and, and acupuncture points specifically for different types of disease conditions such as pancreatitis, diabetes, skin conditions. And in particular, some of those things like skin conditions and diabetes, there's been some compelling evidence that that uh, is, assists the Western therapies in their uh, attempt to cure or at least palliate disease. And then finally, restoration of the patient's natural balance, which the body ultimately tries to do. What it is not able to do, however, is to heal permanently damaged or destroyed tissues. So like my knees, okay? I have terrible knees. It makes me very sad, okay? So I used to be a big runner, can't run very well anymore. I can't even really sit on the ground anymore without like a forklift to get me up. And there's no amount of acupuncture that's going to heal me, okay? It might make me feel better. It might reduce my pain. But it's not going to cure the meniscal tears that I've undergone and then the cruciate disease that I've had, okay? So in terms of history, acupuncture goes way far back and actually may even go further back than in Chinese history. Um, in the uh, Alpine, uh, Tyrolean Alpine, they actually found a mummy, um, some hikers out in there. This is the mummy and they called it Etsy. Um, and they determined that he's about 5,000, a little over 5,000 years old. And he's an Iceman um, from the Neolithic period, during the junction between nomads and farming, the establishment of farming civilization. And the interesting thing about him was that on forensic analysis of the mummy, when they, they actually did imaging both radiographically, MRI and CT, they found that he had extensive LS disease that was potentially crippling and painful. They also found on him that he was tattooed, okay? And these tattoos, some of the lines you can see here, and he's got two points here and here, actually correspond with the modern quote or the Chinese charts for the treatment of LS disease, lumbosacral disease. So a lot of the acupuncturists out there and the historical um, buffs, the history buffs, like to think that this is maybe the first evidence of the use of acupuncture points um, in, in a man that predate China um, that uh, exist. We do know, however, firmly that acupuncture and Chinese medicine is firmly established within their history, going back to the Shang Dynasty, where there were actually priests for horses. Okay? It was a very equestrian-based culture um, built on the backs of a horse. Um, going back to 1766 to 1122 BC, um, BCE, um, before uh, the Common Era. In the Zhao Dynasty, we see the first uh, emergence of the things that we associate with Chinese medicine, yin and yang, the five elements, if you've ever read anything about that, which we're going to discuss, and also, coincidentally, the first fully time-employed veterinarians in the world out there um, working on the uh, emperor's horses and also the first evidence of acupuncture. 
In the Tang Dynasty, there was an establishment of a comprehensive veterinary educational system, so a school, okay? And in the Song Dynasty, they were actually the first hospitals, and these were also for horses, okay? Those were the ones that received care. These are some charts of a um, food animal that actually pertain to just after the Song Dynasty for the, the pig and the cow. In terms of modern history, most of you don't think modern in terms of 1840. That's more my era, right? Okay. But um, there, it actually, unfortunately, within China, um, there, there was a waning of interest in traditional medicine, okay? And a uh, emergence of uh, Western medicine within the, within the culture. Um, and the, this allopathic approach, which we are very familiar with. So there was actually nothing done in a lot of traditional Chinese medicine. The knowledge from there and acupuncture was lost. Um, and it was still practiced within the rural communities, but um, there wasn't much credit given. In some cases, people were punished um, for practicing medicine. Recent developments with Mao, there he is, Andy Warhol, done, okay? And the People's Republic of China began to re um, revive traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture starting around 1950, okay? Also, coincidentally, Nixon visited China in 1972 and brought back with him to the United States knowledge uh, of traditional Chinese medicine and actually um, prominence. And in the 1970s, there was an explosion of Eastern philosophy within the United States. Um, and uh, a lot of people started looking in and studying this. And um, this is really the beginning within the United States and within Europe of people um, actively seeking training in acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. Within the veterinary world, in about 1973, we had the first case uh, within Austria of a veterinarian treating a cow successfully with acupuncture. And then in 1974, this is the granddaddy of them all, and if you ever want to have additional training in acupuncture, the International Veterinary Society of Acupuncture um, was established. Okay. The science of acupuncture, I think that's an amazing photo, don't you? It's, all, it's beautiful, but also kind of scary at the same time. This is what it looks like in veterinary medicine. Who knows what this is? Yeah, porcupine. How do you say that in Portuguese? Porcupine? All right. Well, at any rate, he got in a tangle. I wonder who came out looking worse, huh? Okay, disclaimer. Unlike your uh, normal lectures in internal medicine, okay, this is going to go a, a little bit deep. Um, and the, the physiological mechanisms of acupuncture are often a little fuzzy, okay? Um, and they're somewhat incompletely understood, particularly if you are approaching it from a Western state of mind, okay? And no one theory in acupuncture, and we're going to present a few of them here, can adequately explain all of the different types of effects that we see or think we see when we treat patients with acupuncture. Okay? But we're going to do our best. So how does acupuncture work? Those of you that have sat through my lectures, you poor things, um, know that from a Western perspective, okay, we have actions at the local level, at the systemic level, we have some effects with segmental analgesia. We have some very definite autonomic effects. And we have some central effects. This is an old dog being treated with hip dysplasia here, um, right over the coxofemoral joint. This is a bladder 40. It's the master point for the collar portion of the abdomen. And this is a bao hu, which is a point that actually is also treating the collar portion, the lumbosacral area of the back, as well as weakness in the spine. In terms of local mediators, I apologize for this. This is just a cascade, okay? And really what happens is when the needle is inserted, it creates tissue damage, okay? And that's the whole point. We're creating damage. That releases plasmin, and the plasmin causes a complementary cascade, which then mast cells react to, okay? Mast cells release histamine and heparin and cause a phospholipid ca cascade which causes the release of prostaglandins, okay? 
you see a reaction of vasodilation and erythema at the point of your needle insertion. And if you look in people, if you've ever had needles inserted on you, it's very interesting. You'll get a little welt right around the needle. We don't see that very commonly with animals because they're haired, um, but there is a reaction at the site of needle insertion. This in turn causes bradykinins to become elevated and then a change in the nociceptive fiber activation. Okay? And those are proven. It is interesting though that one of the most difficult things, you think, well, why can't we prove that acupuncture works? Well, they have tried, and they have tried with controlled, blinded studies. However, what we found in those studies is that both the sham-treated sites and the acupuncture-treated sites both have effects. Okay, so known acupuncture points and points that are just randomly placed in tissues. They both have effects. Part of that can be attributed to the placebo effect, okay, which is true in animals, but also that part of it may, is maybe due to the fact that there are a lot of different schools out there that have mild differences between the point locations in the body. And that is particularly true for veterinary medicine. Okay? All of our meridians and all of our points are extrapolated from, from people, ultimately. Okay? In terms of systemic humoral effects, the humoral definition of humoral is pertaining to the humors of the body, not the ha-ha, but a fluid or a substance. And these are the endorphins, the encathlins, and the dynorphins. Doesn't this dog look happy? I mean, he looks pretty happy, and he just ate a porcupine too, right? So he obviously has a major endorphin release there, and this is produced by the brain and the peripheral body. I see I have another typo there. Whoops, sorry. For systemic humoral effects, um, the role in pain management here is not completely defined. However, they have done research studies where they've actually looked at the analgesia effects of acupuncture and tried to reverse them with naloxone, um, indicating that there is some sort of opioid or opioid receptors that play a central role in this um, action. In addition, transfer of CSF fluids from a patient who has received acupuncture to a patient who has um, not received acupuncture induces analgesia in experimental studies. In terms of segmental acupuncture, this is stimulation of nociceptors of the dermatome, myotome, sclerotome of an effective area. Okay, and these are called trigger points. We've all heard of those. And if anybody's pushed on one in you, you, were, you would go, ah! right? It hurts, okay? Those are kind of uh, points that are very sore in our body and usually attributed to tension, okay? Um, they're also called, in acupuncture, ashi points, which loosely, if you say it sloppily, right, sound like O oh, points. And that's the big joke within the acupuncture world. The jokes are kind of lame in the acupuncture world, but that, that is one of them, okay? And this is due to the activation of C fibers and alpha delta fibers resulting in analgesia in that segment of the spinal cord. In terms of segmental analgesia, this is associated with the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and can be explained by gait control theory, which actually Dr. Olby should be up here lecturing on. But it has to do with the small fibers and the large fibers that go into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And actually what happens is that this gate is closed by stimulating the faster, smaller fibers that don't allow the large fibers to bring in their messages. Okay? And it basically effectively closes the gate to that information and you don't feel the pain. The autonomic effects, and everyone says you should know this, the one point that most veterinarians know is the governing vessel or the GV26. It's located on the midline, just below the philtrum of the nose. Have you ever heard of what that's used for in your anesthesia classes, in your critical care courses? Have you ever talked about it? I hear whispering, perhaps. Okay, so the governing vessel 26 is actually a stimulation point of the autonomic system. And if you have a patient going into a cardiac arrest, stopping of the heart, okay, you stimulate that point, you basically take a 25 gauge needle or a needle and you just poke it right in there into the periosteum, grind it around, it's exquisitely painful. Um, oftentimes you'll revive these patients as of magically, okay? 
um, they thought that they think that this works through autonomic effects and they act to control visceral pain. And this is controlled via the somatovisceral reflex where the visceral functions are activated or inhibited by somatosensory stimulation. In the slide I'll show you later, we, in certain points within the um, acupuncture channel system do have pretty significant effects within um, the GI system, within the heart rate, within blood pressure, all regulated via autonomic, uh, the autonomic nervous system. Centrally, acupuncture points access different portions of the brain. There are research studies here looking at stomach 36, which is this needle here. It's located just off your greater trochanter in this first muscle here, which is your cranial tibial muscle, okay, proximal point. Putting it right in the center of that is the master point for the abdomen within the Chinese system. And this, in studies looking at the brain during activation of this point, activates an area within the hippocampus, okay? And this particular point in people is used to create energy, um, awareness, um, awakening, okay? So if you're low in energy or lethargic, um, oftentimes they'll treat that point for you if you go to an acupuncturist. And that corresponds with the hippocampus and its activity um, in terms of, of being awake, being, um, uh, having uh, memory, et cetera. Um, it also is used in animals quite commonly for um, inappetence and stimulating appetite. Uh, the gallbladder 34, which is just above it, okay, is actually located right off the fibular head, just proximally and a little bit distally off of that point on the lateral aspect of the tibia. In studies looking at that stimulation of the point, it actually stimulates a hypothalamus um, and the insular and motor cortices. It's used to treat hind limb pain, weakness, and, and local stifle problems. Okay? And again, it correlates with the anatomic portions of these brains that potentially will have impact. But it's interesting that the points are so close and different points of the brain light up. Okay, that's a baby porcupine. Pretty cute, huh? Okay, so how does acupuncture work from an Eastern perspective? Okay, everybody put on their seat belts, okay? All right? Differences and similarities, okay? In our Western approach, we're focused on detecting and eliminating the cause of a disorder. I don't know if it's drilled into you here, but um, in North Carolina, we tell students and we teach them from the get-go that most of the time, an animal presents to you, they have one problem, right? And have, they may have multiple signs, but you're usually looking for that one problem to make everything fit together. Not always, you can get complicated cases, but you're looking for that primary or primary problem, the most important problem. And it, we use the problem-oriented approach, and we analyze individual systems or symptoms to understand the cause, and we group them together, okay? And we have high-yield diagnostics, clinical signs and we have lower ones. The lower ones you're told to ignore and you go for the higher ones that are going to point you in the right direction. Does that sound familiar like what you, you learn here? Maybe. Okay. Maybe we teach something funny, Dr. Olby. But in terms of the Eastern uh, perspective, the origin of the disease is seen as an interaction of a lot of different things that are mutually interdependent, okay, and come from both internal and external influences, okay? And the whole point of acupuncture in traditional Chinese medicine is to integrate all these variables, don't eliminate them, okay, integrate them all together into a clinical picture that includes treatment. So it's really, really a very different approach to how we look at problems. Okay, so I often liken this, and I was mulling over last night how to compare it, like I was going to do apples and oranges, but it's not really, it's just different ways of looking and measuring things, okay? And I liken the Western approach to a very linear approach, A to B, okay? We want to keep it simple, the, you know, you have that saying, keep it simple, stupid, right? The more simple it is, maybe just in orthopedics, the better, okay? And the more likely that you're not going to go astray. In Chinese medicine, it's more like a template, okay, that creates a picture. It's measured, however, it's not a linear thing. It's more of a two- or a three-dimensional thing that you're measuring, okay? 
So, in traditional Chinese medicine, everything boils down to yin and yang, okay? And yin and yang ultimately need to be in balance, okay? If you have more yang, you have, your yin has to give. And if you have more yin, your yang has to give. And this is displayed in this Taiji symbol here um, that you're pretty familiar with that is probably representative of all Asian cultures of yang being the light portion, the active and outside portion. And in Chinese medicine is usually represented by the dorsal aspects of the body and the top portions of the body. Whereas the yin cycle or the dark or black cycle here is the internal side. And of course, we have to attribute this into male and female. And the yin is seen as more as female in character, and the yang is more male. Okay? And the characteristics of yin are they are cooling, moistening, nourishing is a big function of yin, and transforming, such as transforming food into energy. Okay? Yang, being more energy related, um, is warm, hot. Okay? moving, securing, and protecting, okay? Yin and yang together, when you put them together, you can't ever separate them. If you do, they say that that equals death, okay? Um, and then when you put them together, that equals qi, or life, okay? Make sense so far? That's step one. So in Chinese medicine, there is a concept of five basic substances, okay? And this is kind of like Chinese physiology, all right? Think of it like that. And so there are the five basic substances are qi, zhu, which is blood, jin, which is essence, shen, which is vital spirit or consciousness, and jin yi, which is body fluids. So jin yi is kind of like the opposite of you, or blood, and it is mostly related to body fluids, plasma, intracellular fluids, etc. Whereas you is the Chinese concept of blood, okay? But it's not actual blood per se, but it's the closest thing we have to blood. And it's the material aspect of energy, okay? Which is life energy. And again, that's made from yin and yang. And from a philosophical perspective, Qi is a source of everything. If you, know, if you have qi, you know it all, okay? And it is a source of life in general, and it's the basic substance of the world and the human body, okay? Shen uh, is consciousness, okay? And so when someone has a big shen, they usually are a big spirit. So oftentimes you'll hear Chinese names referring to that in terms of spirit or consciousness. All right, so that's kind of physiology from a Chinese perspective. I'm boiling it down to the nitty gritty here, okay? Zhang Fu is like Chinese anatomy, all right? And this is the Chinese term for internal organs, okay? And Zhang are all the parenchymal organs. They also happen to be yin organs, okay? Remember yin and yang, the female thing? And fu is the viscera, okay, the action-oriented male. And these have to be any hollow or organs in the body. Now, in China, actually in a lot of the ancient civilizations, any type of autopsy, cadaver, cadaveric, cadaveric dissection, I'm tired, um, was actually taboo, okay? So their knowledge was somewhat uh, approximate. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so for example, they thought that the spleen was responsible for digestion. Okay? And you laugh, you think, oh my gosh, how could anybody think that? But if you weren't allowed to open up a body, okay, uh, even an animal body, because it was sacred, the spleen does kind of sit in that area, okay, and it's it's close, okay? But again, it, it's, we, they, we call it the spleen, but it just relates to digestion, okay? But it's called the spleen. Um, and the other thing you need to know is that each of these internal organs, which we're going to see in the next slide, is linked to a channel and a meridian, all right? 
Okay, so here are all the parenchymal organs, or the yin organs, and here are all the visceral organs. And each of the organs um, that are parenchymal have a visceral counterpart, okay? So the liver is linked to the gallbladder, so they got that right, okay? The heart is linked to the small intestine, which sounds odd, okay? The spleen is linked to the stomach, fairly reasonable, okay? The lung is linked to the large intestine, Again, a bit strange. I'll give you that. And the kidney is linked to the bladder. That's good, right? All right. So this is the problem-oriented approach in Chinese medicine. Okay? And you've probably seen this before. And it's not as horrible as it looks. But you remember all those organs that you saw in the, the previous table? Well, they're now all placed into these spheres. Okay? And they're all into the large intestine, the heart to the small intestine, the liver to the gallbladder. And each one of these pairings, so it's yin and yang together, remember we're keeping those concepts together, okay, has characteristics, okay? And they link them to seasons, they link them to smells, they link them to body parts um, where you actually see clinical signs. So this one's interesting. So the liver and the gallbladder are linked to clinical signs seen in the eye. And they do a lot of diagnostics from the face or from the ear. And so if you think about it, you know, icterus, right, appears in the eye. You see yellowing of the eyes. So that's kind of, that's very interesting. Um, the, uh, so here we go. So, and it's also linked to color, um, time of year, a type of uh, environmental phenomena, phenomena um, eyes, smells, taste, and then emotion, okay? And oftentimes, so for example, I tease my husband, I say that he's off, he's stagnated in his liver, okay? Or he's, he's blocked liver because oftentimes he gets very irritated with me. And so it's not me, it's him, right? His yin and yang is out of balance and therefore he feels enraged with me or with the children. The other thing you should note here is that each one of these areas is associated with different points of the body where they manifest. And so, for example, if you had a liver stagnation here, um, the, where you're going to potentially see manifestations of disease are not only in the eyes, but also potentially the tendons and the ligaments and areas. Okay? The other point that we're not going to really go into here, but is um, the concept of Shen and Ko which are the governing factors of this physiologic cascade. So the Shen is seen as kind of a mothering, nurturing cascade or control panel, and the, basically follows in a clockwork um, fashion. So the liver nurtures the heart, the heart nurtures the spleen, the spleen nurtures the lung. And so if you ever want to treat, for example, a uh, heart, which maybe an animal is being fearful or um, you're having issues with cardiovascular problems, you could potentially treat the liver. Crazy. Okay, keep listening. It makes more sense later. The co is the grandparent. I think this is kind of a funny analogy, but basically the co is the, the governing. If you want to tamp down or restrict activities here, you use the co cycle and use the liver to treat the spleen. Okay? And it's a negative impact. All right. Keep that in your mind. It's very pretty, isn't it? So before you say I'm crazy, or that thousands of uh, individuals in Asia are crazy, or people pra that practice tr traditional Chinese medicine are crazy, really all this is about, in terms of an Eastern examination, is kind of a convoluted Western examination, where we have things that make total sense to us of how we look at things. We look at vital signs, TPR, blood pressure, et cetera. We look at general appearance. We then go through a, a physical exam, which is in some ordered fashion, either tip to tail, or you do it through an acronym, okay? This is the Chinese methodology of holistically looking at the body, okay? And again, the names are different, and the organization of things are different, but the methodology is, is, or the principles are the same, okay? So let's talk about the channels and meridians. This is the subway system in Porto, where we are going tonight, okay? 
And the channels and the meridians are comparable to a subway system, okay? Where the flow of energy or chi is like a subway car, okay? That is moving along pathways. And this subway is a three-dimensional scheme, okay? That connects superficial areas in your skin to your internal organs, okay? And it moves chi in and out, okay? Much like a subway goes from a stop to, a, uh, to another stop. And these stops are acupuncture points in your body. Make sense? So these stops, again, the passengers can get off, the chi can get on or off the car, all right? And the chi will transport um, throughout the body and tie all the body s systems together um, and to, into a functioning community, much like a mass transit system does in a city. Okay, there's links from the outside to the inside, from the right to the left, from the top to the bottom. And this serves to protect the body also against exogenous pathogens, which is something probably that the subway system analogy doesn't really cover. All right, points of interest. This is something my daughter made. It's very unattractive and it did not taste very good either. But she was very proud of it. Okay, these are the fun points that you can use at parties and wow all your friends, okay? Pericardium 6, this is probably one of the most well-known acupuncture points other than the governing vessel um, that we talked about earlier. It's an extremely popular and useful point. It's the master point for the chest and the cranial abdomen within um, Chinese medicine. And the pericardium um, in Chinese medicine was seen as the uh, high advisor to the heart. Okay, the heart rules everything in the Chinese medicine. But you couldn't ever talk to the heart in Chinese medicine. You, always, you could only talk to the pericardium. So it was much like the emperor in some of the dynasties um, in the kingdoms. You would never ever talk directly to the emperor, but you would talk to his advisor if you wanted to get information or have any cause or effect. So the pericardium is the point that we go to when we want to treat things of the cranial abdomen with a T, whoops, let's cross that out, and the chest, okay? In people, it's helpful for treating insomnia and calming the shen, okay, or that consciousness in the mind. It's also the point for treating nausea and vomiting, particularly in pregnant women, okay? Women that are, um, are not, are just so nauseous, particularly in the first couple of, um, uh, trimesters um, that they can't take drugs, they're feeling really sick. This is a go-to point. And what people often use are these acupuncture, acupressure bands. It's located, if you take three fingers on the medial aspect of your arm, and you, I could take my gloves off, but you see this first crease here on your arm? You place your three fingers down on that crease and directly above it, located in between those two tendons there, is this point called pericardium six. So if you're ever feeling sick, okay, during a car ride or something like that, that's a great point to, to press. And, you know, I, it, re, it works in my book. So you see this picture of that naughty little boy right there? That's my son when he was younger, okay? And he could not even get in the car without throwing up. I still have banana located in between the window and the door lodged down the car side of the car door from him throwing up at 70 miles per hour, sort of half in the car and out the window, right? So he would get sick everywhere we go, and we would never go anywhere without these. It also applied to airplanes. I was the mother that when you were trying to get off the airplane, I had the little boy that threw up right in the front of the airplane and stopped everyone from getting off. You know, that was me, and I'm sorry that happened, okay? Um, and it t smelled terrible, and it was very embarrassing. But that was my son. And this actually changed our lives, okay, uh, in terms of, of, of working. The biggest thing is you need to put it on prior to you feeling ill, okay? Um, it will work better, although it does work still to some degree, but not as effective um, once you're sick, okay? and you have to press pretty hard. Governing vessel 20, okay? This is located in the top of your head. If you follow your ears, 
I'll show you the top of my head, hopefully. I have my glasses up here. So you follow up to the top of your head, okay, from the, the top of your ears, in the middle of your head, okay? That's governing vessel 20. It's used in the management of depression and anxiety. You look pretty stupid doing this, but <laughs> I must look stupid too. Okay, um, in people, and in particular, they've done studies in people showing that this point and actually the four points surrounding it um, is very effective in clinically depressed people in terms of treatment in lowering their doses of antidepressants and anti-anxiolytics. It happens to be the meeting point for all your yang meridians, okay? It's at the top of the body. And in dogs and cats, it's an even a more easy point to find. I'll show it to you in another slide. But you know the occipital crest that you feel in dogs and cats? If you follow up in the proximal portion of the ears up to that ridge, right on top of that ridge is where governing vessel 20 is, okay? And this is the first point that most acupuncturists use in treating patients, okay? Because a lot of times patients are fearful. They pick up on the fear mostly from their owners that they're gonna have needles stuck in them. Um, and it, it really works in terms of calming. Let me show you. Here's a cat um, that we're treating as governing vessel. This is a cat that actually had pancreatitis and horrible fatty liver syndrome was, and we were treating it for um, anorexia at the time. Um, but the first needle I went ahead and put in is this governing vessel 20, and the cat fell right asleep. If you don't believe me, here's a dog. Unfortunately, I didn't get it right at the very beginning. But now it doesn't work in all dogs, okay? And maybe this dog fell asleep on their own. I don't know. But it's actually impressive when you do just put a needle in, and in certain cases there are, um, it seems to be, high responding people and low responding people, and high responding animals and low responding animals. So oftentimes I'll tell people that are trying out acupuncture for the first time, so just try it, okay? And we'll see, if you notice a difference, we can continue therapy. If you don't, we don't have to do it anymore. And the ones that are high responders, it's pretty remarkable, okay? Bao Hu, which is called the 100 meetings points, is the convergence of yang energy in horses, okay? And the reason why, from according to Chinese philosophy, is the horses are grazers, okay? So it's not the governing vessel 20 at the top of their head. Their heads are usually down and in the grass. So therefore, the highest point for yang energy in horses is their rump, okay? Located at the LS region of the body, that pink dot there, okay? And that's used in horses, and that's the, the initial point that they use there for treating anxiety and a variety of hind limb um, and lumbar problems. And again, it's located approximately right around the LS junction. Bladder 23. This is probably one of the most important points um, within acupuncture or the, um, utilized. It's called the back shu point, shu meaning association in Chinese, and it has direct effect on kidney chi. This will be important in the case that we talk about in just a minute, okay? Um, and it strengthens the brain, the bone, and the marrow, and it also benefits the mind, brightens the eye, strengthens the caudal back and stifle. This is, that sounds like it does everything, right? That's a good point. You wonder about that. But this is the key point utilized in most acupuncture prescriptions for intervertebral disc disease. Um, bladder 23, bladder, uh, bladder 52, and uh, bladder 40, okay? It's located one and a half soon, right off of midline. And as soon, depending upon the size of the individual, is one to two fingers, okay? And you can see here, it's located in, here in people, okay? and off the caudal border of L2. Bladder 40, which we mentioned here, is located in the center of the popliteal crease. This is the master point in terms of Chinese medicine of the lower back and hip. It's used very commonly treating osteoarthritis of the hip and stifle and most problems of the spinal cord, weakness of the hind limb and the caudal paresis and paralysis. Again, 
intervertebral disc disease. And again, it's a concept of potentially treating, when we look at the next case, above and below the disc space that's affected, we're treating locally here, and then opening of the channel here distally to either allow chi in or out, depending upon what you have going on. In people, this is commonly used for lower back pain, and it's right in the back portion of your knee. Stomach 36, we've already mentioned this one. This is the master point for the abdomen and the GI tract. It's located again off your tibial crest and your cranial tibial muscle here. Benefits spleen function. What does the spleen do? Digest things, of course, right? Okay? And so it's involved in the transformation and transportation of food and energy. It also tonifies, and the word tonify in Chinese medicine means strengthen or add to qi, okay? In people, I mentioned this before, this is the go-to point you say, doc, to your Chinese medicine doctor, I feel terrible, I'm tired, I'm lethargic. This is the point that they're gonna to use to treat you. And you say, that's nowhere near where I'm tired. I'm not tired in my knee, but this is actually going to give you energy um, from a Chinese medicine perspective. And in animals, in addition to giving energy, okay, which we often co combine with bladder 23, we use this point um, also to give them a little pick-me-up. Here's that little kitty that we're treating, and there's actually several needles that you actually can't see, but one of them, you can barely see it here, is stomach 36. We also treated um, stomach 25, which is right off the umbilicus here, um, and a few other points there distally. Unfortunately, the cat didn't really respond, um, but I've had dogs respond to this, and anorexia is one, particularly ano uh, anorexia due to nausea, due to chemotherapeutic agents, is very, very responsive, particularly in people, and there's, there's real um, clinical evidence to, to prove that. Here we are treating it in a dog. Stomach 36. Okay, here's the final one. For all of you that went out last night and don't feel so hot, in addition to doing uh, Dr. Olby's tonic that she gave you, was that what you did? Okay is large intestine four, okay? And this is the master point for your face and your mouth, okay? And it uh, removes obstruction of chi. It's used in people to treat headaches, migraines, and labor pain. So if you're ever in labor and things aren't going well, this is the place to go. So it's right in between your uh, thumb and your index finger, okay? And you should push in and you should actually feel, it should be painful, okay? if you're in the right spot, uh, pressing pretty hard, okay? Um, and it actually, it, it works pretty well for, for massive headaches if you don't have, you know, ready access to ibuprofen, mainly because you're hurting yourself here and you forget about what your head's doing, right? Uh, <laughs> but doing this for about five or 10 minutes, you know, you'll notice that your headache will go away, all right? Um, dogs who don't have a dew claw Okay, you treat right at the level of the dew claw. Okay, um, so it's between the first and second metacarpal bones um, uh, of your thumb and index finger. Okay, so that's it for the party stuff. Let's talk about a case. All right, we have Halloween coming up. Now, I don't know about you. You guys don't have Halloween here. We take Halloween very seriously in, in our house, right? Um, and it's where trick-or-treaters come. That's my husband again. You can't see him. He does, normally doesn't have hair. Uh, but he sits on the porch, and we live in a neighborhood. We live in a historic neighborhood. Now, you're going to think it's funny. Our house was built in 1888, and that's very, very old. Um, and uh, everyone comes through because we're the spooky neighborhood in Raleigh. So we get... Um, four to five hundred trick-or-treaters that we give out candy to. Takes all night. We get dressed up. It's very exciting. All right. This is Sydney. Sydney looks hungry. Sydney is a six-year-old female spade Dr. Olby special. That's because Dr. Olby loves these dogs. And she was presented to rehabilitation post uh, surgery, laminectomy at L2, L3 with fenestrations of L11 to or T11 to L3. And on neurologic exam, she was motor negative, pain positive, with upper motor neuron deficits, the both hind. 
The client goals would have normal ambulatory function. On assessment, she was paraplegic. She um, had no motor, but she had deep pain. Um, she had normal tone, so she was upper motor neuron, and that would make sense of where her lesion is. But she also had moderate um, to mild pain of her back, and she had a bit of a kyphotic posture and was protecting her back. So from a traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, discs are very similar to tendons and ligaments. As such, they're influenced by blood. Okay, I'm going to bring up that previous very complicated slide here in a minute. Discs are also a part of the spine. And in the Chinese world, the spine is ruled by the kidney. All right? And in some ways, you can maybe make up a story that the kidneys are up close to the spine, the TL area, okay, in terms of association. But treating the kidneys and the kidney points will affect your spine. So when a disc deteriorates, it loosely dehydrates and loses its elasticity. And this is perceived in Chinese medicine as a lack of blood nourishment, okay? And it leads to stagnation of blood. And when you have stagnation of blood, you get pain, right? So the rule in acupuncture selection very um, broadly is that you treat them locally, which we understand. You put needles in around the area where the animal hurts. Okay? And those local mediators, which are well documented, will take care of the pain. But you also go the extra step and you treat the underlying pattern. And in this particular case, we'll always involve treatment of the kidney, okay, kidney for back pain. All right? And maybe also treating the liver, because the liver is uh, in charge of blood and it's the primary source of blood. Okay? And when you think about it from a physiology standpoint, it is a huge reservoir of blood, um, as we know it within Western medicine. Okay, so bringing in that complicated pattern, okay? So we're going to look here to use the kidney in the Shen cycle or the nurturing cycle to treat the liver, okay? The kidney is involved with treating the spine, okay, or the bone. Okay, um, and it's going to be focused on this particular area. Okay, so in terms of Sydney's acupuncture point prescription, we started with the governing vessel 20. Remember that? And we're going to reduce Sydney's anxiety. Okay, she's going to become very relaxed. She looks very happy there, right? Okay, we're reducing stress. Then we're going to treat her locally. Okay, and we're going to treat her right around where her lesion was. So we're not going to treat on the lesion because that could potentially be too painful. But we're going to go up to about T10. Remember, she was fenestrated to T11, and that's bladder 18. Guess what? That bladder 18 is the association point for the liver. I sound crazy, don't I? I'm not, really. Is it, so you're actually treating the liver in addition to treating locally. And we're going to treat her down here at her lumbosacral joint. Um, and that's going to treat the uh, area locally where her spine is affected in terms of pain. And also, the bao hu point is good for hind end problems and, and weakness, which she definitely has. We're also going to treat the underlying pattern, and we're going to do this by treating the kidney. Okay, remember that diagram. And we're going to use bladder 23, which is often used for back pain. Okay? And it's also going to provide energy to our body. Okay? And we're going to augment this with bladder 52, which is the needle right next to it, which is called a belt pattern in Chinese medicine. And it basically just augments your, whatever you're doing on bladder 23. We're also going to use bladder 40, okay? again, using the kidney, to help with the hind end weakness but it's a distal point to hopefully re remove obstructions from the channel um, as well and allow qi to move more slowly or move more um, throughout the system um, because this is seen as a qi stagnation, again, causing pain. And that's what it looks like there. And that's what Sydney looked like afterwards, a few days later. Now again, I'm going to say this just for Dr. Olby's perspective, is that Sydney's probably getting better on her own, okay? 
This isn't necessarily, I'm not one of those people that say acupuncture cured this patient, okay? But potentially acupuncture is an additional tool in your toolkit that you could utilize for patients, particularly patients that are having problems with ambulation and are slower to recover. Um, there, there is actually pretty compelling anecdotal evidence in these guys that it is very uh, effective at treating this particular type of disease. Okay, last few slides. I know you're tired. I, because you guys have been treating us and we've taken pictures of you all in your robes, we wanted to show you what our robes look like, which aren't actually as regal as yours. So this is our graduation, and our students are known everywhere for how they decorate their mortarboard hats at graduation, and we usually get written up in the newspaper, and they, they, students take quite a bit of pride and energy in this. So here's one. And this person actually went into pathology, and this is actually an eviscerated monkey. It's a little bit of a dark humor thing going on here, but has a, a celiotomy going on and the stuffing coming out. She's now a pathologist. Okay. Uh, this person is obviously going into equine medicine. All right. I think this person is just taking a vacation, <laughs> perhaps. But everyone pretty much decorates their more boards. It's, it's a lot of fun. And you'd always know where vet med is, is um, coming down the aisle. And the other thing that they do is they take their palpation sleeves and they blow them up and wave them around, too. So, anyway, that's, that's kind of what we look like. And obrigado, that's my new favorite word, by the way. I've been saying it. <laughs> and literally, that's the end. Alguma pergunta? Is there any book uh, already talking about uh, acu acupuncture in animals? Yes, or? there are. There are several. One of the best ones I found I actually have with me you can look at. It's actually a handbook of acupuncture in the dog and the cat. And it is basically the most boiled down version of acupuncture you could possibly get. It also gives the points, um, prescriptions there, and locations. You know, I hesitate to say that's enough to get you completely started, but it'll give you an understanding. There are also much more extensive texts. The only thing that I'll tell you is some of them are fairly hard to read, okay? Um, they, they go, it's, a, it's kind of like reading an existential philosophy book when you think you're supposed to be reading medicine, okay? So, you know, have a glass of wine, all right, <laughs> while you're reading it, and just kind of, you know, take your time in going through it. But there's several texts. But the handbook one is quite good, okay, and I can show that to you. Okay. Uh, and uh, Sydney, um, she didn't, ha didn't have any type of uh, therapy. She did. Uh, uh, I left uh, that part out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course she did. Am I crazy? No. <laughs> okay. Yes, you think I'm crazy now, don't you? Uh, no, so she had your typical rehabilitation. She went in the underwater treadmill. We did the assisted standing, all the stuff we've been talking about. So we didn't just do acupuncture. I wasn't trying to pull the wool over your eyes or anything there. It's just I was trying to make it shorter. So. Okay. okay, that does it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mais alguma pergunta? All right, well, thank you so much for being wonderful to us. Thank yeah. you. All right. Iremos agora fazer um curto intervalo e dentro de breves momentos, após a chegada dos participantes da sala de exóticos, iremos então proceder à sessão de encerramento. Durante esta, decorrerá a entrega de prémios das comunicações livres. Muito obrigado e até já. Boa tarde, vamos então dar início uh, à sessão de, anun para anunciar os vencedores do concurso de pósters e comunicações livres. Vou então passar a palavra à professora Ana Cristina. Então, para uh, as comunicações livres, como sabem, uh, havia duas categorias, animais de companhia e animais exóticos. 
As, as, as apresentações foram avaliadas pela Comissão Científica em termos do que era a apresentação, o, a, o grafismo dos slides e principalmente o conteúdo científico e tenho a anunciar que para a categoria de animais de companhia o vencedor foi a doutora Marta Alegria com um disco escondido por corpo estranho no caso. É. Pedimos então à Marta que deixa ao palco para receber o seu prémio. Para a categoria de animais exóticos, é com muito orgulho que eu apresento o vencedor, o Dr. Roberto Sargo, com síndrome vasovagal no coelho, New Zealand White. categoria de póster, uh, os parâmetros avaliados foram os mesmos, não, não a forma como o orador expressou, mas a forma como o póster estava escrito, as restantes, os restantes parâmetros foram os mesmos e tenho a anunciar que o vencedor foi a doutora Cláudia Soares Cardoso com a acupuntura após hemilaminectomia em gato paralítico. A doutora Cláudia não está presente, também não, não deixou ninguém em sua representação, portanto confiamos que uh, os elementos da associação <risos> irão, irão transmitir-lhe uh, a notícia e enviar-lhe o prémio. E pronto, isto é a comoção da família. <risos> Vamos então dar início à sessão de encerramento de, das jornadas e dou a palavra ao Presidente da Associação, João Tomás. Uh, em nome da Associação dos Estudantes de Medicina Veterinária da UTAD, queria deixar aqui alguns agradecimentos. Uh, queria começar por agradecer à Comissão Científica, uh, que desde novembro do ano passado se mostrou bastante disponível para nos apoiar uh, na realização destas jornadas. Queria agradecer também às empresas que nos apoiaram e que sem a, sem a ajuda delas este evento não, não seria possível e todos sabemos uh, que este país está, em termos da economia, está bastante complicado. Queria agradecer também a todos vocês a vossa presença que engrandeceram este, esta, esta 16ª Jornada Internacional de Medicina Veterinária. Queria agradecer também a presença dos oradores, doutora Natasha, doutora Diane, doutor Vladimir, Dr. Lorenzo, thank you very much. Uh, queria, por último, também deixar um especial agradecimento a toda esta equipa da Associação de Estudantes de Medicina Veterinária, o fantástico trabalho que tiveram para a realização destas jornadas. Sem eles isto não, não seria possível. Um obrigado bastante especial. Uh, por último, espero que tenham aproveitado estas jornadas. Espero que tenham adquirido bastantes conhecimentos. Uh, este, estas jornadas tiveram uma componente científica bastante interessante, bastante completa, temas bastante, bastante atuais e interessantes. Uh, espero que tenha enriquecido a vossa, o vosso conhecimento. Aproveito para vos informar que na próxima quarta-feira uh, irá decorrer o terceiro fórum de investigação em, uh, em investigação farmacológica. Podem se inscrever se quiserem se inscrever agora podem ir ao secretariado ou então enviam-nos um e-mail. Podem também se inscrever no, no site do fórum. Uh, 
Obrigado pela vossa presença e espero que estejam cá para o ano, nas 17 Jornadas de Internacionais de Medicina Veterinária, que serão de equinos e bovinos, provavelmente. Obrigado a todos. Passo agora a palavra à, representante, à professora Ana Cristina, em representação da Comissão Científica. Um, depois destes agradecimentos tão completos, a mim cabe-me já dizer pouca coisa. Uh, e em nome da Comissão Científica, queria mais uma vez agradecer a todos os presentes, quer os participantes, quer os oradores. Foram vocês que fizeram uh, que estas jornadas uh, fossem uh, mais uma manifestação daquilo que é o, a transmissão de conhecimentos científicos e aquilo que pode ser a importância do meio académico nesta divulgação. Um, queria também, tal como o João, convidá-los a estar presentes no próximo evento e queria, uh, o João já o fez, mas eu pedia a todos os presentes que uh, dessem uma grande salva de palmas a todos os elementos da associação que fizeram cumprir estas jornadas até ao fim. Levantem-se. Levantem-se para agradecer. Pronto, e... Com esta salva de palmas e com este agradecimento a este conjunto de pessoas que fez possível este evento, damos assim por terminadas as 16 Jornadas Internacionais de Medicina Veterinária da UTAD. Esperamos encontrá-los a todos aqui para o próximo ano.